Good evening. At this time, I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting of October 25th, 2021. For viewers watching at home, other commissioners and members of the public are participating via video conference or teleconference. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which it stands. For which it stands. One nation. One nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Lanson? Present. Commissioner Link is absent. Commissioner McMahon? Here. Commissioner Newman? Present. Chair Bus? Present. All right. Tonight we have with us uh, Planning Division Manager Steve Kearns. Mr. Kearns, are there any written comments, announcements, or continuances at this time? Yes, thank you, Chair Bus. We had two supplemental packets, one distributed to the Planning Commission on Friday the 22nd. That supplemental packet contained uh, suggested findings for approval of the, the, the um, proposed development agreement and also contained correspondence that was attached to a June 21st staff report that uh, it, that could, was for this item, which was continued to today. And another packet uh, submitted to the Planning Commissioners today, which contained correspondence. All of it is related to item 7A. That is all I have for you. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Uh, now is the time for public comment. This time, any person may address the commission regarding a city planning matter that is not on this evening's agenda. Should the commission wish to discuss an issue raised by a member of the public, the issue will be referred to staff for scheduling on a future agenda. Anyone who would like to speak under public comments must complete a speaker card and file it with the recording secretary before the public comments portion of the agenda is called. The speaker's remarks should be addressed to the commission as a whole and not to an individual commissioner or staff member. Unless otherwise provided by the Commission, speakers are limited to five minutes. The screen will show you the remaining time you have. I believe that we have two speakers this evening, and so I will call the first one. Um, please, after I call your name, please state your name and city of residence, just for, uh, for the record. And we will begin with uh, Michael Sanford. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. My name is Michael Sanford. I'm with a company called Pacific Metal Roofing. And the purpose of my speech tonight is that I'm trying to get permission to put metal roofs on housing in Thousand Oaks. I've been in business for over 30 years. I've been in Thousand Oaks since 94, and I could put metal roofs up almost everywhere else in Los Angeles and Ventura County, except Thousand Oaks. And my knowledge, the reason we don't hear, have Metal roofing is because long, long time ago, somebody said it was too industrial. But we put it up in Hollywood, we put it in Beverly Hills, Pacific Palisades, we have it everywhere and it's becoming more and more common. I had eight houses in the burn zone in Malibu. And even though the neighborhoods went up in flame, not one of the houses that we put in went up and caught on fire. It is an extremely high rating, fire rating. And the purpose might speech tonight is to try to get you guys, the folks, to change around so we have permission to put metal roofing in Thousand Oaks. That's the gist of what I'm here for. Thank you. I appreciate that, sir. Um, Mr. Kearns, is that something that the uh, Planning Commission can address, or would that be something that the City Council would address? Uh, that would be the City Council. The Metal roofing prohibition in residential areas because it's in the architectural design guidelines for single family. Um, it only allows three different kinds of roofing types in residential. Commercial can allow um, have a metal roofing. I will reach out to Mr. Sanford and guide him through the process and we'll, we'll see what we can do. You I have it. his contact information. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is uh, William Maple. Mr. Maple, you have the floor. Hello, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak on this item, but it's the development of the old Cuneo Continuation School site. Um, yes, sir, that would be uh, 7A. I can move you to that time slot if you'd like. I would, appreciate okay. that. Okay, we'll move you over to 7A, and uh, I believe that will conclude our public comments. Next, uh, we have the consent calendar with the minutes of October 11th, 2021. Do any of my fellow commissioners have any comments or a motion to approve the minutes? Chair Boss, I would make a motion to approve the minutes. 
Thank you. Uh, will the secretary prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Chair Buss? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. 4 0. Thank you. All right. And if the clerk is prepared, uh, will you please open the public hearing? Seven A, a uh, hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item seven A, general planned land use amendment LU 2019-70504, lot line adjustment LLA 2020-70272, development agreement DAGR 2020-70273, zoning change ZC 2020-70275, Specific Plan SP 2020-70276, Development Permit DP 2020-70277, Oak Tree Permit o OTP 2020-70278, Landmark Tree Permit LTP 2021-70289, and Mitigated Negative Declaration MND 2020-70279, to adopt a specific plan and allow construction of a 218 unit, two and three story apartment complex, preserving, repurposing the two existing timber school buildings and a 120 room, three story hotel. The project consists of 13 buildings, including the existing timber school buildings located at 1872 Newberry Road and the applicant is Daylight Thousand Oaks, LLC. Thank you. Presenting on behalf of staff is senior planner, Nazar Slim. Mr. Slim, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, I'll begin. Thank you, planning commission and members of the public. Uh, the project before you is a request for a horizontal mixed-use project at the southeast corner of Newberry and Kelly Roads. Uh, staff would ask uh, Planning Commission tonight to recommend City Council accept mitigated neg negative declaration MND 2020-70279 uh, in accordance with the California Environmental Equality Act uh, and with the following uh, with the following. Uh, applications as well, excuse me. Uh, general plan land use amendment LU 2019-70504 to go from commercial to commercial residential. Uh, zone change 2020-70275 to change zoning from C2 to the new uh, proposed SP, pl SP plan 21. A lot line adjustment 2020-70272 uh, to reconfigure the existing lots into two legal lots of record and uh, a specific plan SP 2020-70276 to adopt SP 21 to establish development standards for the subject site. A development permit DP 2020-70277 to allow the development of a new multifamily residential and hotel development. As I said, as I said this would be a horizontal mixed use development. Uh, it would include 13 buildings, two of which are existing, and that was refer, uh, referenced uh, timber school uh, buildings. The new buildings would comprise, or the remaining buildings would comprise the 218 units, uh, two to three story apartment complex, and lastly, the 120 room uh, three story hotel. As I mentioned, adaptive reuse of the historic timber school buildings, so the existing buildings as well. And lastly, we have the Oak Tree Permit 2020 70278, uh, removal of six live oaks and the preservation of two coast live oaks, and the Landmark Tree Permit 2021 70289, encroachment of four California sycamore trees located off site, and removal of three California walnut, walnut trees. Okay, I guess lastly, one more development agreement uh, 2020 70273 establish the standards and community benefits for construction of the proposed project, as well as phasing and timing of the improvements. 
So just a little quick background here. Uh, the physical site itself uh, is comprised of uh, 9.667 acres. It's located at 1872 Newberry Road, southeast corner of Newberry and East Kelly Roads. Uh, currently standing is the Timber School uh, Auditorium buildings and remnants of the maintenance yard. Uh, just some quick notes on topography. The north portion of the site is relatively flat and somewhat level with, with Newberry Road. There is a slight transition. Uh, site, uh, site transitions upward, however, to the south, approximately 16 feet higher than the northerly area. The southerly pad is approximately eight feet lower than the homes to the south. And I just want to make sure we understand the eight, foot, the eight feet there is an actual average. So there are different uh, varying heights uh, as well. Some additional history here. On October 8th, the residential capacity allocation was approved and a general plan amendment was initiated by city council that allocated 218 units uh, for residential portion of the project and endorsed the mixed use concept. And 2020, uh, January 23rd, pre-application meeting was conducted. And in uh, 2020, May 28th, the applicant began submitting formal applications. In terms of the project project, uh, sorry, project process, uh, we did have the pre-screen procedure, the pre-application review, and formal applications. Those steps being achieved, we are now we satisfied the prerequisite steps to be here tonight. And, and the planning commission's role before us is uh, to make a recommendation to city council on the proposed project. Just some quick uh, surrounding land uses. Uh, you'll notice the site in the middle here. Uh, there are commercials on either side to the east and west, uh, residential to the north, just actually north of uh, 101, residential to the south. And there is actually a, also a hotel development uh, to the east, uh, sort of the southeast corner. Now to get to like a project summary here, we're looking at, again, we mentioned 13 buildings, two of which are existing. That, that refers to the Timber School. There are going to be nine uh, multi-dwelling buildings associated with the apartment complex. They total uh, 218 units. Uh, out of those units, there are 26 affordable units, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the structures themselves are gonna range anywhere from two to three stories. There is a pool house and also the hotel uh, on the north, uh, sorry, northeast corner. And the hotel right now has a capacity where, or is entitled for a capacity of 120 rooms, but uh, there's also a possibility maybe less. And that is three stories. Uh, also, to include uh, as part of the, the proposal, there are two publicly accessible plazas, one for the Timber School Corner Plaza and one for the Kelly Road Plaza. Uh, these will be quasi-public in that they will be managed and run by the owners, but they will be accessible to the public as well as residents of the property. And here's just a couple renderings here to show you the Timber School Corner Plaza, sort of a conceptual uh, of how that'll look. And again, there'll, there will be access uh, in around the corner of the plaza as well as through and around the buildings there. This is what the Kelly Kelly Road Plaza would look like. You see here also pictured are the two oaks that are going to be preserved as part of this proposal. A little bit more about the apartment complex itself. As I mentioned, it's 218 units. Uh, the unit mix is as follows. There's going to be 15 micro units 29 studios, uh, 89 one bedroom units, uh, 85 two bedroom units. And again, of the 218, we have 26 low income units, nine two bedrooms, nine one bedrooms, four studios and four micros. Uh, just to give you an idea, a little bit about the low income units, uh, they are low income. And so just to give you an idea of the, the income uh, levels we're talking about, average me uh, median income, uh, they do run in the 80 percentile. So as you can see here, this, this, um, this matrix kind of starts with one person, two persons, three persons, et cetera. So it just kind of progresses from there. But that's just to give you a, sort of a snapshot idea of, of what that would look like. To start the evaluation, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, internal Paseo network. Uh, it has, has multi-functions here. Uh, it offers uh, additional gathering opportunities. So these are actually wider. I mean, they're made for pedestrian circulation, but they also have this sort of extra space for people to commune, uh, to converse. Um, they'll have seating area, some additional hardscape um, they have a better walkability and circulation because, again, they're 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 wider and, and they have a more it'll be a more pleasant experience in general. Uh, lastly, it is going to contribute, I, I believe, to the overall so social health of the complex. 
anytime you have an opportunity for people to, you know, residents to meet, to talk, uh, it does uh, help to build a sense of community. And I think that's uh, pretty important. Um, just to give you a little bit, uh, kind of a quick look here of what a rendering would look like of the one of the internal paseos. And this is what it would look like in between the buildings. So you see how it sort of eliminates a very narrow, uh, narrow walkway and it does make it more open, less more sunlight in, et cetera. Uh, a little bit more continuing with the project summary. I want to talk about the common open space. Uh, total common open space for the site is going to be roughly uh, 45,000 square feet of the site, which is fairly generous in comparison to other projects. Uh, we do have these labeled here. So A uh, would be the Timber School pl uh, Plaza, as I mentioned, it is quasi-public. So it is open to the public as well as residents. They could make use of it. And you can see here the extent of the plaza. So it does allow people to kind of wander through. Um, uh, the number D there, or the letter D there, is just uh, pointing out the internal Paseo plazas. In addition, we talked about Kelly, Kelly Road Plaza right there, and of course the pool area. So that's just kind of a snapshot of what the uh, common open spaces would look like. And again, those are open to the to the residents. Uh, the two plazas are open to the public as well. Give you an idea of what the private um, private open space would look like. These would be spaces that are uh, private to the units, individual units, uh, and only to be used by the residents of those units. So as you can see here, these are you know, kind of a typical layouts. Um, just to give you an idea of the square footage, uh, 115 square feet is roughly the smallest one they have, and that's for the micro unit. Um, next would be 120, there's some that are 130 for the studios. And again, for the two bedroom, they range anywhere from 165 square feet to 180 square feet. And just to put it in perspective, this, uh, Thousand Oaks Municipal Code only requires that a uh, personal or private private open space be 100 square feet per unit. So you can see that these uh, figures do exceed that standard. Um, this is another just a view here of the hotel. Let me talk about the hotel for a little bit. So 120 20 rooms is what what it's been entitled for. It is three stories, stands at about 35 feet tall average. And over here I have pictured uh, Timber School just to kind of show you in, in relation to that. There is a parking lot in between. Um, that allows a little bit of space, uh, like sort of a, a, a spatial relationship thing so that the hotel isn't overshadowing the historic structure there. A little bit about the architecture. It is mission revival style. It does include a similar roof, uh, roof style and veneers as the apartment buildings. So the hotel is in fact, architecturally gonna be related to the, uh, to the uh, apartment buildings as well as the timber school itself, because it does does take away some uh, some cues from the timber school historic elements as well. And talk a little about the timber school uh, rehabilitation and, and adaptive reuse of the two existing buildings. Um, any major modification to the exterior would require review by the cultural heritage board. At this time, uh, the specific plan does allow certain commercial uses in this in the two buildings. However, those uses are gonna be uh, sort of low intensity. The idea is to avoid any any reason or any, any potential uh, major remodel of the structures to accommodate a more intensive commercial use. A little bit more about the architecture. So again, just now turning to the apartment buildings themselves, just kind of list a little bit, some more features here. Again, Mission Revival does include stucco, stone accents, uh, clay clay tile roofs. Uh, there's multi-pane windows. They do trellises as well. And again, the materials uh, and, and the design itself do complement the historic timber, timber school structure. So they do, again, uh, take take some uh, some cues from those uh, historic structures and apply them to the, to the new structures as well. And also, this is a, a view of the interior apartments. You know, staff just wants to note that the, the architectural treatments, the trellises, the, the stone uh, textures that are being used on the outside facades are also being used on interior. So there is a quality of architecture throughout the development. It isn't just uh, you know, limited to the uh, exterior facades that are visible by the public, but also for the interior as well. With respect to parking, there are going to be three subterranean garages that are going to hold approximately 277 stalls. Um, the, 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 all the use of these subterranean garages really uh, helped a lot with uh, amenities on the surface. 
the paseos that I pointed out earlier would not have been possible if there was more surface parking because that would have eaten up more of the surface area. So that's uh, something to note. Uh, in terms of parking, uh, also staff wants to kind of just talk a little about that. There's 554 total parking spaces. It does exceed uh, municipal code and as well as the uh, proposed SB 21 by 19 spaces. Uh, each development should be noted is parked exclusively. In other words, uh, there isn't any parking spaces that the hotel would require that aren't on the hotel property. Uh, and likewise with the apartments, so there's no need for uh, sharing of parking spaces. Here's just a little bit of a breakdown of the parking. This, this parking table here kind of shows you how the required parking was arrived. Again, it should be noted, apartment units were parked at the, at the municipal code uh, standard, and we ended up with 12 extra spaces. The hotel and associated uses, in this case, we used conference, also was parked at the rate uh, or standards for the uh, municipal code with just two extra. And again, Timber School uh, with the gallery use, in this case, we assumed the gallery use since that's been talked about quite a bit in terms of uh, the, the uh, entitlement packages. So we used that as a, as a rate and then also we ended up with five extra spaces. So again, a total of five, uh, 19 extra spaces on the whole of the, of the project. With respect to height, uh, the commercial portion, which is gonna be the hotel, would have a 30, 35 foot uh, maximum height. The multifamily residential apartments would have a maximum of 45 feet height. However, this maximum height is only gonna be reserved for buildings that are furthest from the street and also not abutting any of the residential properties to the south. Uh, structures on Newberry or East Kelly Road shall have an average maximum building height of 35 feet, or in this case, uh, two, two stories roughly. Um, I'll talk about number of stories here. Portions of the building, again, just to reiterate this, uh, or, or to clarify it, portions of the building uh, facing single family residence properties will be restricted to two stories uh, for any building mass nearest to the said property. In this case, uh, 70 feet is that distance. So if it is closer than, or if 70 feet or closer, it would have to be two stories. If it's further than that, they can go to the three stories. Uh, one thing that we should note, uh, we did mention that there are 26 affordable units as part of this project. Typically California law does allow certain concessions uh, for providing affordable units. In this case, the project did not take any concessions. They did not uh, opt for a concession for parking reduction uh, or, or for the height. The, the 45 foot, however, is addressed in SB 21, which is proposed. This next part of it, uh, just to kind of further evaluation on the height, uh, these, these two sections kind of help to uh, illustrate or demonstrate kind of what we're talking about. In this case here, if we look at building N, this cut through here, this shows that the, the structure that's closer to the house, in this case, it was uh, actually 66 feet here. And this is actually the closest point that it gets to the properties to the south, they are required to be two stories, in which case this is what is being shown. Also, given the uh, uh, proposed landscaping that's gonna be going in, as well as the existing uh, fencing and line of sight, there'd be very minimal viewing of the actual, the third uh, third stories that would be like more interior to the, to, the, to the site. As you can see here, building M, which is further interior, this would be abutting the parking lot of the hotel the hotel here would be facing Newberry Road. So again, just to get this is a cross section through the entire site here, building C, this cross section A. Building C would be the hotel. Building N would be one of these, um, would be the furthest south uh, apartment building. And of course, building B does, does the same thing here by cutting through building E. Um, but you can see here that it is about 100 feet from Newberry Road. Another slide here might help to kind of, you know, bring that into light a little bit more. So again, just what I talked about, so building in here would be one of the, the buildings that are closer to the properties to the south. Over here, you can see the dimension at 66, 66 feet roughly. So this building being uh, closer than 70 feet would have to have the building mass that's closest to the properties to the south at two stories. And this is what you see pictured here, two stories. There are some building elements here that, that do come up, but they are allowed to go up to three stories once they get past that, that initial building mass. Uh, in this case, this, this bottom uh, enlargement, the partial section, uh, section BB, does show a building <clears throat> at three stories. However, this building is 86 feet from the properties. As I mentioned earlier too, we talked about the eight foot uh, average distance. 
or average elevation change, you can see that the properties to the south, and these are ones off of Galway, are actually elevated. Um, and then you can compare the two here uh, to 670 uh, feet uh, sea level as compared to 655 foot. So there is a difference over here of nine feet, six inches. And over here, this should really be 13 feet, but there is a difference of 13 feet here. So really when you subtract the 13 feet from the, from the two stories, uh, which comes in, I believe at around 35, uh, you're looking at about a 20 foot, uh, 20 foot, you know, height, height clearance here. And with the landscaping that's going in, and we'll discuss landscaping a little bit further down, um, it should, it should do a pretty good job of obscuring uh, the buildings here from the residences to the south. For tree protection, uh, as we mentioned, there are going to be uh, eight affected oak trees and nine affected uh, landmark trees. Of those eight oak trees, they are going to be removing six, uh, and I'll talk a little about that, and they are preserving two. The two that are being preserved are going to be going in, as I mentioned, uh, on the Kelly, uh, Kelly Street or Kelly Road Plaza. Uh, the six oak trees that are being removed are mostly on the transitional slopes. It's unfortunate that because of the trend, uh, the, or should I say the grade, the sloping grade, the, uh, <clears throat> the trunks and the root system have grown in such a way that it would be difficult to transplant them because you'd have to transplant them at a grade at a similar, you know, similar slope. And it just, it's just not feasible. We do have um, the applicant's arborist on hand too, if, they, if we need to discuss that further. So of those eight, I said we are, we are as we said, we're, we're saving two of those six that are, that are being removed. There are going to be 18 mitigation trees planted. And we'll get to that in a minute here, but the site does have enough room to accommodate those 18, uh, 18 new trees. For landmark trees, um, of those nine, there were going to be uh, uh, three California black walnuts that were actually in not very good shape. Um, they were going to be, uh, actually, let me see if I look here. Yeah, those were going to be removed. They are on Newberry Road. They were in declining health. Um, so those, those would be removed. The six trees that are being preserved are the Toyon trees. <clears throat> and those are in the southern, uh, I believe the southern eastern corner. Uh, they're also on the slope, but they are in an area where they're not going to be disturbed uh, for the new development. Uh, and for the removal of those three uh, walnut trees, there are going to be um, nine mitigation trees planted. And again, those trees should be able to be accommodated on site. And I'll get to that uh, in a minute here. Uh, this is the landscaping plan that's pro being proposed. You can see these yellow markings here, those uh, yellow trees that I'm showing, those are gonna be the mitigation trees. There's a total of 27 mitigation trees for the removal of those, uh, those trees that I mentioned. Uh, in general, uh, the total landscaping that they're providing exceeds the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code requirement of 10% by 350%. And just to kind of put it in another way, it's actually gonna be 35%. So basically 3.5 times 10%. So that's how much additional landscaping they are providing. In addition, we talked about, I, I mentioned a little bit about the, the landscaping screen to the south. These are where the residents would, would be uh, off of Galway. So they are proposing a large, uh, uh, basically well, a species of shrubbery, I believe it's either the Photinia or Laurel, but uh, like I said the arborist can talk a little bit about that, that uh, the shrubbery should end up being about 25 feet tall at maturity. So that should do a pretty good job of screening uh, any potential uh, viewing of the buildings um, uh, to the north. And again, uh, just to show, <clears throat> excuse me, there are the, the preserved uh, two oak trees in the Kelly Road Plaza. At this time, staff would, again, would uh, ask that the uh, Planning Commission recommend to plan, uh, City Council the following, accept the MND 2020-70279 and approve the project based on the staff report findings and subject to the conditions of approval in the attached ordinances and resolutions. Those are attachments four and five. Uh, that concludes the, uh, the presentation. Uh, staff is available for questioning. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Slim. Do any of my fellow commissioners have any questions of staff at this time? I don't see anybody raising their hand. Oh, wait a minute, now I do. Uh, Commissioner Lanson, I'll let you go first, sir. All right, thank you, Chair Buss. So just a few questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Slim, for a very detailed report. A lot of information to go through, and I, I know there's a lot of uh, other questions, so I just wanna kinda hit a few ones that were uh, of a concern or a question to me. 
Um, I know uh, there was a city council meeting before with regard to the phases of the process. And I wanted to see if you could speak to that a little bit in terms of, uh, I know the part of this process is to kind of do the units in one phase and the hotel in a second. Uh, could you explain kind of how that's gonna work? Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Sure. Um, so the reason for the phasing was, it was a discussion piece and it was uh, an idea arrived at because it was going to make this project more feasible for both the owners and for the city. Uh, what the phasing does, it uh, well, it compels the development to occur in this fashion. The phase one is going to be for the apartment buildings, as well as the site infrastructure, and that does include um, any of the trenching for stormwater disposal, for uh, future sewer connections, etc. Uh, in addition, it does also address the on-site vehicular circulation and pedestrian circulation. So that would go in place in phase one. That would take care of the apartment complex as well as any of the uh, vehicular circulation that would come in and around for the hotel parcel itself. Uh, two reasons for that. One, we wanted that in place so that the site functions well and none of it kind of falls a little bit wayside where it's a forgotten parcel. The second piece of that is it also, by, by providing that vehicular and pedestrian circulation, it is gonna provide also emergency access for, for, fire, for fire safety and code. A second phase will allow the hotel uh, to come in at a later date. The spacing I believe is three years uh, in between the start of one phase and the other. But I also, I know we have a city attorney on hand who worked extensively with the development agreement and he can answer any other questions or maybe further elaborate on, on my comments. But, but I'll just finish up by saying the hotel at that, at that time would, would be able to come in um, and then they could develop the hotel. Uh, also the idea was to give them a little extra time to find the more suitable um, hotel brand, if you will, uh, uh, for the area. Anyway, if, if, if that satisfies your, your question, I'm happy to stop there. Otherwise, if you, you need a little more information, I think it'd be a good idea maybe to get uh, uh, assistant city attorney on that as well. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Slim. And, and to your uh, question, Mr. Manson, uh, obviously you know that we went back to city council to talk about the phasing, which was a major element to uh, the discussions that we've had. Uh, we, that's no surprise. Uh, it was initially planned as one phase. Um, so when we brought it back to them, one of the challenges with when you have more than one phase is trying to ensure that the whole project is built. And when we're trying to negotiate and provide Measure E units um, and, and discuss um, aspects of the, of the project itself, the goal, of course, for both the applicant and for the city is to make sure this whole project gets realized. So there's three major elements. We all, we all understand that. Timber School is one of those major elements. We're going to refurbish it. Uh, revitalize it. Uh, we have the apartment supports in the hotel. So one of the challenges we had when we heard from city council that they were uh, favorable at least to exploring this opportunity for two different phases was to how to um, modify the agreement to try to incentivize if there's more than one owner for each lot to incentivize that both both phases get built in, within a time frame. And after discussing with the applicant and, and their team and for, for the public and for, for you as commissioners, um, both sides spent a lot of time uh, negotiating and talking about this project for a long period of time as well. So it's not without a lot of effort that we all came together for tonight to say that we are, uh, staff is recommending this to city council based on all the things that we've gone through on this project. So as Mr. Swim mentioned, some of those things included uh, Whoever, whatever phase goes first, that they're responsible for putting all this infrastructure in. And as part of this, and, and I'm not sure if Mr. Sam talked about it too much, but there's a, a element of a $3 million bond money that we have available that was previously provided to this project when it was a commercial proposed project uh, years ago, and now it's still available to now. And that is a bond money that could be used for public infrastructure that's in this area so the money must be spent in this one zone and this location is located in that zone where the bond money may be, may be um, uh, spent. And why that is important is because this is an area where we're gonna be able to use this bond money to not only help the applicant with this project, with the, with the infrastructure around the project, but with grading, with stormwater, with uh, flow of water, and, and also for the beauty of it too, where it includes the sidewalks. So there's gonna be an expansion of the sidewalks 
um, uh, extra uh, types of uh, traffic control devices and, and things of the nature that are part of this that that um, we get to use a bond money for, which is appropriate. Um, and it's been it's been there for a period of time for this area, but also the applicant gets that advantage of having to uh, assist it with it with this project finances as well. Uh, but with that, we have some requirements that are in the agreement that talk about when uh, they get access to the $3 million bond money. It's up to $3 million, by the way. And so that would help. Again, it's more of an incentive to ensure that once the second phase starts, the additional money, the $3 million, up to $3 million, is going to be provided and allowed to be compensate for the cost for the infrastructure that the applicant or the developers are going to bear when they're constructing this project. Okay, uh, one thing just in terms of timing, and I noticed Mr. Slim said three years, and I noticed there's a few of the con the conditions, um, I think number three that mentions three years. Is that for both phases or just phase one or that's, what? That's for phase one, and we talked about that for a long time with the applicant trying to come to terms on some time period. And one of the challenges we have is this is going to be a, a larger kind of a complex. Uh, a typical standard thing you would have for an entitlement would be three years. We ultimately came to the conclusion uh, and to the agreement that three years was an appropriate thing to recommend to, to you and to city council uh, once it goes in front of them. And then again, another part was how soon after the first uh, phase starts that the second phase has to start. And so it's actually two years. So it's a three year to start. And again, it can start before that. You know, that's important too. They could start within a year or within six months if they wanted to, obviously. Part of that's always to be a financing, construction costs, loans, all those factors that you all know about. And then for the second one, it's just to, you know, the applicant was very clear that they were concerned about hotels and getting the right fit for this location. We want a three-story hotel, not a, uh, for lack of a better term, not just a, a simple one. We want one that's gonna, that's gonna be a benefit to the city and gonna be a benefit to the residents and to the to people who are going to come and visit here. Uh, for a lot of reasons. And so we, we're hoping that by giving them a little bit more time, uh, they believe that they're going to be able to get a good candidate for uh, an uh, for a owner or a, a hotel operator in this location. And the, the only thing I would say is, is maybe look at that language of number three and the condition to make sure that it's clear that that condition or that timing applies just to that phase, uh, just to make sure there's no misunderstanding so that um, they have that additional time in the event there is a phase two. That's just, again, something to look at. Sure. Um, I noticed in the materials there was indication that I believe Mr. Sellers had sent an email indicating the applicant was agreeable to the, everything that was in the conditions in the report. I just want to confirm that's still the case, at least according to staff's mentality. Yes, and, and that was an important element. We, again, uh, not to beat around the bush, but we certainly spent a lot of time with the applicant's team and, and trying to come to terms. And um, it was with a lot of effort, and again, professionally on both sides, in my opinion, that we came to an agreement at this point to present to you with a recommendation. Um, and that did include some uh, final decisions that were made that we had to have clarified and those were given. Okay, I can just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Um, as to um, the, the timber school itself, I think the materials indicated that um, the, the use would be determined, it sounds like at a later time as to whether it's going to be offices or community benefit, um, what, what process would be gone through as to determining how that would be used, that building would be used? So uh, if you allow me, um, sorry. Uh, so the actual timber school, the renovation and repurposing is gonna be run by Matt or managed, I should say, by the owners of the apartment buildings. And so that's why it's really, you know, I think one of the things we wanted to do is wanted to leave it a little open-ended so that the uh, economics and, and local market kind of dictates what would be appropriate. We didn't want to go ahead and, and, and shoehorn anything in there. Um, the SP21, the specific plan, does list uh, several um, commercial uses that are allowed in there. Um, and they include things like galleries or uh, you know, professional office buildings. Uh, part of that can be used as the, uh, and, and this, at least at this time, as a management office for the apartments, but they may end up using a, a unit, one of the units, and that may free up that space for something, all, maybe for community meetings. We're not, you know, again, we're not sure. It, uh, there could be some smaller uh, coffee shops, cafes. Again, as long as they don't 
disrupt the, uh, the the actual structure with too many like venting fenestrations in the in the walls and that kind of thing. But that, that's that's what we're, we're by virtue of being a historical site. Is there any additional building code requirements or things that are above and beyond city involvement that they would have to be considered as part of that? That's a good question, and I know we have somebody here from uh, buildings department uh, to to possibly answer that question. I do know that as, as far as a historic building, they may have certain uh, leniency in respect with with seismic code and that kind of thing. But I think we have somebody here with buildings that could probably answer that. Uh, see if they're available. Hi, Dragos. Do you want to maybe respond to that? Uh, the, the, we, we could design the building for the historic building code, which will allow some exceptions to the newer code. If that answers the question. All right. So, but the, they would have to submit those plans. It sounds like at a later time, not as part of this this uh, this approval process, right? That is correct. Yeah. This this would be right. That is correct. I mean, it would require a TI and, and design review and and, this, and a separate uh, a separate entitlement and separate review package altogether once they start they start that process. Okay. Um, one thing you also mentioned, uh, Mr. Slim, with regard to the affordable units, and you broke them down, and that was great. Um, is there any indication, are those going all over the project or in a specific area, or how are those being disseminated? That's a good question. And the last conversation I had, and the best of my understanding, and an applicant will correct me on this, I believe they're going to be dispersed throughout, throughout the complex, uh, which I think study after study shows that's the way to do it properly in terms of how you how you have the mix of incomes. So is that, that is that something that's up to the applicant as to figuring out, or is that something we can make a condition? I I believe it's 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 up to the applicant. It's it's part of the market, um, you know, something that's that market conventions. But uh, again, to the best of my understanding, when when I was doing the review, I, I recall that conversation, and, and it was, and I was told it would be dispersed throughout. Uh, Commissioner, I think Lassen, if, I, if I can augment uh, Mr. Slim's statement. The uh, affordable housing requirements require the units to be dispersed throughout the development. They can't be lopsided and put in one location to create sort of a low income area of the, of the development. They're, they need to be completely dispersed in different unit types. So. Thank you, Mr. Kearns. That's what I was looking for. So I have a few more questions, but I'll let my other commissioners go first. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Uh, we'll follow with uh, Commissioner McMahon. You have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh there was something that I was reading about at the Timber School, an activated plaza. What does that mean exactly? Just that it would, you know, it would offer some elements that would be inviting uh, to have people, you know, let's say somebody who's, uh, you know, doing a walkabout and they're coming across the corner. It's just a place to, to rest. It's an act of recreation, if you will. Um, sorry, I would say active recreation, but um, passive recreation is what I meant to say. So it's just a place for sitting, gathering, uh, waiting on something else. Uh, there's going to be, I believe, a shade tree on the corner. Uh, and also those buildings, whether depending on the use that we end up with, whether it's a small you know, coffee shop, cafe, or a, a museum of sorts, a place that somebody come in and visit. But that's that's really what it, you know what it's for. And it's like I said, it's open to the public. It is going to be run and managed by the uh, management company for the apartments, but it is also uh, it is also available, accessible to the public. Okay. And then I was going through the development agreement and um, there are certain things I, I didn't quite understand. Um, item number three, it says that it will expire when the project is fully developed. And I, I didn't understand why it just doesn't continue into perpetuity. And I'm oh. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Slim. I'm sorry. No, I was, uh, I was actually, I was looking for, I wasn't sure which item three we were talking about, so. It's number three, I believe, if, I, if, I, if my notes are right. So for the development agreement, one of the, one of the, um, uh, Commissioner McMahon, one of the uh, issues we have in development agreement is the whole goal is to have the project built to the standards, to the, the, um, the portions of the agreement, the sections of the agreement that are are um, before you, right? So mm -hmm. um, the goal, of course, is to have the project done. So once the project's done, that means that all those accomplishments have been done, the benefits have been paid, have been realized. Uh, we have the apartments have been built, the hotel has been built, 
So all those factors come into play as far as why that agreement would end. There are some times where, and it, it just it varies, each one varies, a development agreement might not end at, at a certain time because of continuing obligations. But for this one, for example, if there's an affordable component, there's going to be affordable com covenants are going to be uh, granted and, and uh, recorded, and that's going to control the affordable component, right? When it comes to uh, the units that we're providing, that's going to be realized when they build the units. Uh, when the hotel is built, then that's going to be realized when the hotel is built. The money, uh, the bond money that is being offered to help with the public infrastructure, and again, this public infrastructure is, um, again, it's, it's to benefit the public residents as a whole. Um, that is going to be realized when the construction is being done. So that is why these major elements, that's why it, it, it sunsets, because there's no, no other reason to have it. If there was something that was going to be have to continue further down the line, like payments of some kind or things of that nature, then it would have done a little bit longer down, down the line. Okay, thank you. I have one last question right now, and that was page 10 of the development agreement. And there's a clause in there that says, it's talking about the $3 million. Um, and it says if funds are still under city's control. Sure. They will. Um, so does the uh, applicant know that there's a chance that the city won't have this money and won't be able to reimburse them. So that was one of the that was one of the concerns they have, and and the reason why it's in there is because we are going to do our best to have this. And we, right now, this money is in an escrow account. It is ready to go for this particular purpose, and we have again agreed to provide this money for this very specific project that's part of the agreement. The only thing we don't have is we don't have control of the state, and so if the state were for some reason to do some type of new change in law or new uh, change in, in the bond money has been previously provided and we're to take that away or something like that, that would be something that's out of our control. We wouldn't be, that was the only concern I would have. Just to make sure that as this project goes down the line, the longer it takes, we, again, we just have to make sure that for the worst case scenario, that if the state were to take this money away for some, for some reason, again, not that we want to challenge it or fight it, just more of just ensuring that if for some reason that money was no longer available because of a state requirement, then uh, we don't want to be stuck with the fact that we have to give them $3 million from some other account. Okay. So again, the money to be very clear, we have the money. It is in an escrow account. It is set aside for this particular purpose, assuming that this project is approved by council. But in the worst case scenario, we want to make sure that if three or four years go by, we got to make sure that that money wasn't taken away by some other um, action. Okay. Thank you. That's all for right now. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Uh, Vice Chair Newman, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Chair Buss. And thank you, Mr. Sloom, for your report. Uh, like Commissioner Lance and I have many questions. I'll try to get through them as quickly as I can. Uh, beginning with a follow-up to a question Commissioner Lanson asked about the use of the timber school. Um, Mr. Slim, the answer that you and Mr. Tiorescu gave was about its use was, was about uh, building codes and that sort of thing, given its historic status. Um, I want to ask a slightly different question, which is about the permitted uses for the building. Are there things that the building can and cannot be used for because of its landmark status? Uh, specifically with respect to landmark status, I really couldn't say, uh, but what we did again is we gave it some thought um, and I think, well, part of that is anything that we would propose would have to go before the Cultural uh, Heritage Board. So that's something that they would weigh in on to start. Uh, if we take a look at our, our, our use matrix, uh, there are permitted, um, permitted uses there. Things like the, right off the bat would be like administrative, business, uh, professional offices, arts, craft studios, galleries, and libraries, where it gets a little little different here is uh, when we get into larger sort of restaurants and cafes, that would require a special use permit. So that would mean potentially either it would be administrative, depending on the intensity. If it's if it's something more than administrative, uh, we may have to go to, to commission. I think, well, actually, these are all mostly administrative. The point is, um, they're going to, they need to be low impact uh, uses that don't require a lot of retrofit and renovation to the building to accommodate an, in, um, I would say like a uh, commercial in infrastructure, for instance, if we were gonna do something like a higher volume 
restaurant, you'd have to have certain venting and you'd, there'd be additional fenestrations in the wall and that might not be uh, suited for the, for the historic building. All right, thank you. Uh, there was an MND uh, prepared for this project. Uh, why an MND and not a full AIR? Well, part of that, part of that process is you do an initial study. The initial study has uh, a series of checklists if you meet those checklists, it directs you whether or not it's going to be, you know, a mitigated negative declaration, whether it's going to be a full-blown environmental review or a neg deck. So in this case, we went through the process, we went through the uh, through the checklist, and after answering all the questions and doing the required analysis, uh, it, it it led us to the mitigated negative dec declaration. That's all within the the uh, parameters of of CEQA. Okay, and I, I only learned about the MND relatively recently. Um, so a question to, to follow up is wh where was notice posted about that and, and when? So a good question and I'd have to look that up, but, but notice was actually posted quite a while ago. This was supposed to be going to planning commission I believe back in June. The MND was posted on our website. Um, so there was also, uh, I believe uh, notice was, was uh, recorded with the county clerk um and of course it was posted on our website and it's been up for at least 30 days well i mean that was 30 days up until the june date it's been up a lot longer now so it's it's been up quite quite a few months at this point okay it's the same mnd as the june it's the same MND. there's been no 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 change whatsoever okay very good moving on to the uh oak trees and landmark trees uh the Applicant's arborist report comes with a cover letter disputing that these are landmark California black walnuts. It says these are some other Eastern walnuts. Um, so two questions on that. One is, does the city agree with that position? And two, in a larger sense about all the trees, did the city have an independent arborist review the applicant's report? So we did, we had a uh, basically a peer review of the report uh, and it was basically the same consultant we used for the MND. Um, that particular uh, remark did not come back in terms of what, what the walnuts were, whether they were English walnuts or California black walnuts. Later, later on, the, the uh, applicant's arborist did note that, that they are, and I did get that memo as well. However, let's, you know, taking a step back and look at the bigger picture, Regardless of whether these were English or California, uh, they're being removed and they are being mitigated for. So in this case, we are receiving mitigation trees for these. And if they had not been protected, we're still receiving mitigation trees, which again, that was something that the applicant elected to do on, on their part. So. Okay. And, and I, I don't know if you can answer, but um, given that the walnuts, what, whatever species they are, well, first off, um, you're saying the mitigation trees would be California black walnuts? They could be, or another another type of walnut. I mean, they don't have to necessarily be. It, it, I think with, with plantings like this, you, you, have, you see what's available at whatever nurseries and what's gonna survive in the place you put it. But they would be uh, a variety, I believe, of you know something that would be protected eventually. So it would be like a, a walnut tree, or it could be a potentially another oak. Mr. Newman, uh, the conditions as they're written in the landmark tree permit uh, assume that their, their landmark trees are California black walnuts, and the mitigation is three to one as California black walnuts. So we'll get those on site. Um, okay, so so the replacements would be California black walnuts. That's how the conditions work. Right. Okay, and then approximately how long uh, do we think it will take for the replacement trees to grow to the size of the trees that we're replacing? I would defer to the applicant's arborist on that. Okay. I'm not sure. It depends on water regime and the growing locations and that kind of thing. But Okay, I'll follow up with the applicant on that question. Uh, moving on. Um, Mr. Heher referenced the $3 million in taxpayer debt that will help fund infrastructure improvements that are um, earmarked for this, for this site. Um, Questions, um, does, does the city currently have, or will the, uh, the infrastructure improvements um, provide sufficient water and sewage capacity to service 
218 new apartments and 120 new hotel rooms? Uh, that That's a good question for, for public works, but I, I don't see how, I mean, one of the things is when this first phase goes in, they are gonna be addressing the, that capacity based on the buildings that are going in. So they, they should be able to fit those, you know, fit, fit the infrastructure to meet that capacity. I'm not sure if that, is that what you're, you're asking or not, but um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the whole- My that's question is, does, does any combination of existing infrastructure plus whatever improvements are being done with this $3 million pool of public money, between those two pools, or those two things, is there adequate supply of water and sewage capacity to service this project? Chairman sure, McMahon, this is Mohammed Fatoumi. I'm the uh, Engineering Services Division Manager. And uh, we have looked at initially on that and capacity is available and the water is available. However, they will make some public improvements to the sewer system and the water system connecting the sewer creating, I mean, connecting the water lines, creating a loop as part of the project we will be asking them to do. So it would have a better uh, distribution of water system. Yes, it is available. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Fadiby, I appreciate it. And then following up on the finance side of this, Mr. Heher did reference this $3 million debt. And question on that is, does the applicant uh, contribute anything toward these infrastructure improvements? So uh, the answer is gonna be that it's, right now I would say it's unclear how much the infrastructure, all the infrastructure are gonna cost. This is a big project with a hotel and uh, apartment complex. So with that, what we did decided to do is to offer the $3 million, which was offered before, to not to exceed that amount. If they, 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 uh, you know, if they have to pay more for the public infrastructure uh, and the other infrastructure that they have to do, which I think they would say they probably will have to, um, then it goes up to $3 million. Uh, we are gonna review the, uh, um, the request for payment once it's done. And again, there's a, there's sections of how, how the money is gonna be dispersed. It's initially dispersed, part of it will be dispersed in the first year once um, uh, the public infrastructure is being, um, and, uh, being constructed. And then the other two portions of the three million dollars does isn't paid until there's a hotel starting on the on the other lot. Okay, so so just so I'm clear on the point you just made, if the cost exceeded three million, um, just to make up a hypothetical figure, let's say it's five million, is the taxpayer on the hook for the two million dollar overage or not? No. So typically a, a applicant is responsible for the infrastructure that they have to put in based on the uh, permits that are issued. Uh, in this case, we're just, again, offering $3 million because this bond money must be used in this region, in this very area. And there is also specific need, and I think Public Works already mentioned it, to fix some of the flow problem in this area due to the grading and onto, um, well, um, uh, Newberry Road. So that's why this we thought this was a good project to allow them to use this money as well. And again, it's public funds. It requires prevailing wage for the portion that's used for public funds and all that uh, requirement, all those requirements. There's no additional taxpayer cost beyond. Correct. Correct. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, another question, possibly for you, Mr. Here, possibly not. Um, I could use some clarification about the affordable housing. The percentage of units in this project, I understand to be 12%. I understand we're also going to be talking sometime, hopefully in the near future, about an update to the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. Uh, there are, I've, I've looked a little bit at, at this and I've talked with people who are advocating for substantially higher percentages. Um, there are two cities near us that are at 25%. There are other cities in the area that are 15%. Um, there are people who are saying it should go as high as 25%. In the past, when I've asked the question, are we setting a precedent tonight? The answer, I've always gotten the same answer, which is 
we evaluate things on a case-by-case -case basis. Sure. However, we've also had many hearings where an applicant has said, hey, you did this thing in this other case, so therefore you need to treat us the same way. And if you can, I'd like, I'd like to get some clarification on where we stand with whether or not we're, set, we're drawing a line in the sand tonight by setting a 12% mark for this project. Okay, so I'll break that down into a couple of components. One is uh, well, we have an inclusionary housing, but right now the number is zero, right? So we do not have uh, a 12, 15% or 10% or up to 25%, whatever the number, we don't have a number other than zero. All right, so, so the fact is right now we do not have one that we could say we are gonna enforce this requirement on this applicant. The second thing is that, um, and you are correct, every, every de de development agreement, every type of situation which we have here is gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis. What are the facts? What are the needs of the community? What are the needs of, from council and from planning commission, things of that nature? Uh, so we have to look at those facts when we come up to the terms of the development agreement. I think the biggest thing for us in this particular case is that there is no density bonus requirement here. There's no, they're not getting a density bonus by offering affordable housing. This is something that becomes a benefit to the city in, in my position. And that's why it's recorded that way in the development agreement as a benefit to the city because they are providing a number of affordable com, uh, units uh, on this project. And they are not, as part of that, asking for a density bonus such as you know, more, part, more units based on acreage or uh, shorter um, um, uh, setbacks, things of that nature, height, things of that, that Just nature. to clarify, Mr. Heher, I'm, I'm less concerned with the 12% in this case sure. than with, I want to be sure that we're not tying our hands at 12%. I'm not advocating. Okay, for, so the, the answer to that is we are not. I'm sure that yep, we're going to be able to choose some other number, maybe lower, maybe higher. Right. At some future date. And again, I think the biggest thing that, and you already know this, um, is, um, Commissioner um, Newman, is that we are, in this particular case, we have a development agreement. And so with every development agreement, there's going to be terms. And so that's why the next person cannot say, oh, in that case, you had a 12%, because we have to look at the development agreement and say, no, that was pursuant to a development agreement that, that was negotiated. And so there's no precedent for that for that reason. Okay, thanks for, thanks for that for clarification. Um, the final question I have right now is with regard to uh, EV and charging on site. Um, the language in the staff report, I'm not entirely clear on what exactly is being provisioned. Um, so it says the term of art is the project will provide for a set number of charging stations but the, it, the currency that's, that's used is parking spaces. So I'm, I'm unclear whether or how many charging stations the project will provide. Is there a one-to-one -one relationship between EV parking and EV charging stations? So I'm, I'm gonna start, start to answer that and I think I'll turn it over to buildings as well. Uh, my understanding is that there is going to be in a buildings will answer this portion a requirement to actually have uh, I believe they'll actually have a requirement to have some charging stations if not it's a market driven thing however they will have the infrastructure in place to have those charging stations so the infrastructure is going to happen but I think uh, I mean I may let uh, Dragos with, with buildings uh, answer the rest of that he's available um Yes, the green building standard code requires um, that we have the infrastructure for the EV charger for future use. Um, well, for future use, the question I'm trying to, to nail down here is how many chargers will there be on site? And is that number the same as the number of parking spaces set aside for electric vehicles? I honestly, I, part of my uh, my understanding of this is that it's market driven. So depending on, on that's gonna be kind of up to the developer, depending on what they're looking to target uh, for the residents, uh, it would be a market driven thing. And it's probably some model somewhere that they use for, for residential. So there's no clear answer at this, at this moment on how many charges versus how many spaces. 
Correct. Probably a good okay. question for the applicant, it sounds like. Okay. I do have some other questions related to the letter from the Canadian Climate Coalition we received in the second supplement, but I will reserve those um, in case they're planning to ask those during public comments. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Vice Chair. All right, I got a couple of questions to, uh, for staff myself, just so I'll try to run through these quickly for you guys. Uh, number one, um, I'm aware that this used to be a maintenance yard. I just want to make sure that um, there is no hazmat issues or potential hazmat issues for the developer in the future. As someone who has worked in maintenance yards for a couple decades of his life, I'm aware that sometimes oil exists in those. If anybody can follow up with me on that. Yeah, so as part of the part of the MND, one of the one of the technical studies that was done, I believe, was was a phase one study for oops, for for soils. Um, I know we have our our CEQA consultant here as well. Uh, I'm pretty sure we do, so she's available. Uh, Melissa, if you're if you're on, do you want to answer? Maybe touch on that. Okay, she might not be in the room. Um, anyways, but that's that's my understanding is that you know we did we did look at that as part of the part of one of the, the technical studies as part of the, part of the MND that was done the initial study. So Melissa's on now. Uh, is. Okay. Yeah. Melissa, I don't know if you caught any of that, but uh, regarding the I think it was a phase one or, or soils report that we did for the site. Melissa is on mute still. I'm not sure. Yeah. Let me. There okay. You Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Looking that up right now um, for the ISMND. Um, we did not include in our scope of work um, any phase ones or phase two has not um, site reviews. Um, although we did run a search of the databases um, of hazardous sites and hazardous material sites in the area and we found that the maintenance yard at um, 310 East Kelly Road is listed in uh, GeoTracker, which is one of the hazmat databases with historical presence of underground storage tanks, a removal of contaminated on-site soils. Uh, this was done in June 2009, and the listing is closed with a cleanup status of completed, case closed as of February 2010. Okay, but do we know when CVUSD stopped using that as a maintenance yard? Because I suspect it was after 2010. Yes, uh, Chair Buss, it, was, it stopped around 2012. So those, so those tanks, so those underground storage tanks were removed while it was still an active maintenance yard. My question is, has anybody done any soils testing on that property since it's no longer been a maintenance yard? I didn't see anything in the report, so I, I was just curious if you guys are aware of anything I'm not. No, I'm not aware of any study being prepared or performed for that site that uh, tested the soils. Okay, so um, then if I, underground storage tanks, they would have to. So certify. this would be a follow up on Mr. Newman's uh, question about the checklist that you guys have for environmental impact report versus negative uh, mitigation declaration. Um, is does that fall under the scope, knowing that this place was a place where hazmat was used and potential carcinogens? I mean, uh, we we have Prop 68 warnings throughout the state. I'm just not sure if this falls under that jurisdiction or not, and I was curious. Melissa, can you respond to that, please? Uh, yeah, I'm taking a look to see, <clears throat> looking through the ISMND. Um, there was a geotechnical report, which did include borings of the soil, I believe. Let me see if that had anything. What year were those? Um, 
Looks like 2020. Okay, cool. We didn't say anything about um, soils being contaminated in the EIR, but I will follow up um, with the geotech report. So um, if, if you want to proceed, I you can check back with me in a minute or two. You got it. Just uh, just whistle at us or something when you've, when you've got an answer on that one. I'll uh, follow up with a couple more questions. Um, this uh, one is going to be probably a dumb question for most of you, but um, I saw the difference between a studio and a micro unit, and I am aware that there is a square footage difference. Is this a semantic difference, or are these, is this the actual definition of a property? Mr. Slim, feel free to yeah. answer. Thank you. That's something that we would actually return to the applicant as well. I believe it's a um, it's a market driven nomenclature. So it's really the micro is just a studio. It so happens to be a smaller studio. Uh, if I refer to it as a studio, you know, can you make an assumption it's somewhere between 450 and, and 600 square feet? Or, you know, studio can be a, you know, 2,000 square feet. It just really depends. A studio doesn't have a have a bedroom. So. The micro units, I believe, are, are something like market driven uh, and they just uh, indicate a smaller uh, studio. Okay, so this is not a technical term. It's sort of like a loft apartment. Uh, it used to be lofts yes, were lofts and now they're whatever they are. Okay, Correct. makes sense. All right, I, I just wasn't clear on that and it was, it was baffling me. Thank you. Um, then um, I had a third question that I, I think Mr. Hay here may be able to best address. Um, on the $3 million that we're offering up to this developer um, for, for the improvements, um, is this something that the city's done historically in the past for um, these kind of properties? Um, I'm curious, um, relative to um, properties that they'll be developing, improving, and owning permanently versus uh, developers who um, build properties that are for sale to individual owners. Because I feel like we're using borrowed money, uh, borrowed taxpayer money, to fund a long-term annuity to a corporation rather than Im creating an improvement that uh, group ownership would be a part of. Um, if we were building 216 condos and 216 people, uh, individual families were getting the benefit of this, it would make more sense to me than for one or two owners to get $3 million ta uh, taxpayer dollars. You know, this isn't free money, this is money that comes out of all of our pockets. So I was just curious about that, if that's something historically the city's done. I just want to, oh, okay. I was going to add some some quick clarification. A portion of that money is also going to go to improving the sidewalks, uh, creating landscaping along Newberry and Kelly Road. It's also going to have some uh, specialized differentiated paving. So there are a lot of that, uh, you know, at least half the improvements are going to be basically back to the public, back to the city and how this whole project gets framed. You know, whatever happens after that is, is something else. But what I'm saying is, uh, a portion of, that, of those funds will be going to, 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 when I say public infrastructure, the very sidewalk that we'll be using, uh, the corner, the intersection, and then the rest, yeah, the rest will be on site. But I'll let, I'll let I, that I'm go. aware of the, the improvements, Mr. Slim. My question is, is that uh, when we do that in a residential neighborhood, um, hundreds of owners benefit as opposed to two. And that's my question. Sure. Okay. So this bond money is RDA bond money that was... Um, collected and placed into accounts and specifically put into zones that had to be has to be spent in a certain region and this apartment this project here is one of those regions where it could be used it was initially offered when the initial project was presented uh, for um, this location with a school district and then this developer uh, purchased it from the school district to uh, assist them with this infrastructure project uh, to allow for uh, basically, it's 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 a combination of public funds and private funds to fix this area, and this particular project again it qualifies for the use of the bond money, so that's why it was offered. And again, it's uh, we don't have any other project at this point to use this bond money, and we agreed to again from before, and now we're doing the same thing again with this project to maintain this three up to three million dollars to be used. 
Again, it's for public infrastructure. So it is, uh, has a public component to it. And yes, it does alleviate some of the cost, obviously that um, the developer will, will bear. Um, and again, we don't always have those projects, but they do come around once in a while where we're using uh, public funds to support a project of some kind. This is uh, just one of those. Again, this is a very specific circumstance for this location because the bond money must be spent in this region. And this is the one project that we have to spend the money on. Hang on. Um, uh, hang on. I would need to follow up on Mr. Ayer's uh, answer to me. Uh, question number one, did you say that it is both public and private money? Well, the public money part of it is going to be up to three million dollars. Okay, the three million is public. I just, I just right. wanted a clarification on that. Sure. Uh, the second question is, uh, what is the last project that we did something like this on? So uh, I don't have the answer to you at this point because the bond money was. Can you name any? Uh, no, sir, sir. I couldn't name any. No, but I'm, what I'm telling you is that the okay. bond money was used for different projects in different zones. This is one of the zones that we have money left over with the bond money left over for this zone. What's the geographic uh, um, area of this zone? It goes up, it goes up Newberry Park. Um, I mean, Newberry Road, excuse me, up to uh, the west a little bit. Um, and so between like Borchard and Ventu or? Uh, I'd have to, I would actually check and maybe Mohammed Fatimi might know. Yes, um, if I may uh, continue with the yes, response, please. I'm going to that is that the area, the, the money was collected by the pro property owners in the area as part of the taxes and it was put into RDA for the benefit of the area, which is between Newberry, uh, within Kelly and Ventu Park on Newberry Road. A uh, big portion of it is this area. One of the major uh, uh, repair area in this area, one of the major problems they had was the flooding of that intersection, which this would be responding to some of the storm drain work. We're gonna be doing this and all the money is gonna be used, the public money for the public benefit, not necessarily for two owners. It would be for the whole neighborhood benefit, which includes uh, uh, taking care of the flooding and storm drain system. Uh, public improvements that they are tied to the project of being paid by the project. And the money here, RDA, is for benefit of the public and for the betterment of the a whole area. And Chair Buss. That answers the question. Okay. And Chair Buss, if I may, uh, the second area was the uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard project area. So there's two there is the Thousand Oaks Boulevard project area and the Newberry Road project area. So the, is, so the initial the money that was, of the, of I'm the sorry, go ahead, Mr. Mom. I'm sorry. Go ahead, the Mr. Project, Timmy. I'm sorry, yeah, I thought, okay, go ahead. You have the floor, Mr. Fatemi. You had something to say? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, the Thousand Oaks Boulevard, the undergrounding, the one and a half mile of 66 KV and 16 KV was as part of the RDA project also which undergrounded all the uh, utility lines and community communication lines in that area. If so, you remember, it happened. Few so years that ago. was the project that the money was spent on last time was undergrounding along, uh, along Thousand Oaks Boulevard? Correct. And then the other project was probably the undergrounding of the, the power equipment along Moore Park Road? That was a different funding. That, that was, was a different funding, project. okay. Yeah. So, but that we have three million here that we're gonna allocate to storm drains and water and sewer? No, the water sewer is not being paid by this. this okay. Is mostly for storm drain and street improvements. Okay, so that so it's, so it's limited to just storm drain improvements and the street improvements. Pretty much, yes. Okay. Oh, that 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 does clarify it for me. Thank you, sir. Sure. All right. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, um, uh, Mr. Slim, I did have one more question about the uh, the height differences between the um, backside road uh, of the property and where the uh, single family homes are relative to where the apartments are. Mm -hmm. um, you were showing a, a nine and a half foot difference and a 13 foot difference. My question is, is that um, in the picture, and this may not be accurate, this is why I'm going to ask you, uh, it looks like the underground parking actually makes the grade level of the first floor in these apartment buildings higher than the actual 
uh, current levels that it's at. So I was, I, I'm just asking you, uh, relative to how they grade, how they dig, how everything happens, do have we set a restriction on how high they can build up the land or any of that? Or I mean, are these are these numbers kind of set in stone as far as the visibility, or could these these properties end up being six feet taller or shorter? So let me go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and, and if I can share my screen, I'll also, I'll put that image up, and then that way it's kind of, we can look at it and discuss it. Um, are you able to see that? So yes, sir. So we're referring to this parking structure here. You're saying? Yeah. So if you look at it, it looks like it's above level. Right. And I, I think what that is, honestly, it's it's wherever that cut through happened, um, that that's where they took it. So it could very well be that the entrance. Well, well, they do show stairs here too, so there there could be that as well. Uh, this actually, in my recollection, on some of this, when I look at the plans, it is a, a portion of it is a daylighted parking structure. So there is going to be a portion of it that is above ground. Um, if that's you know a portion that'll stick out, if that's what we're talking about, or yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. So my my question becomes, uh, we're telling people that you know it's it's this many feet below the level there. But if it's that many feet above, we don't have a compensating uh, measurement on this side. You mean from, I see what you're saying. So, so where the first floor starts. Right. So if we're telling people that they can go two stories up, I mean, if they're two stories up and they're already 10 feet up, it's. Right, I got you. Okay, <laughs> so they're, they're sitting like on a podium and now they're above that. So right. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 that, that's true. I think one of the things is um, we, we looked at it you're right. When we did the measurement, um, the assumption there was at grade. So wherever the grade is, uh, you know, we can do the, the, you know, the nearest approximate grade and go up. Uh, another way to address it also is to look at the uh, the mean, um, sorry, the sea level, uh, the sea level basically height, and go with that. Um, I think one of the more important things was to show it relative to the to the property to the south where we have. A defined, you know, defined elevation there in terms of where the the backyards are, and where the houses sit, and how that's going to relate to that to that to that um, to the height of the building. So, perhaps uh, referring to it in a, uh, you know, the average, I guess, average elevation, uh, sea elevation would be would be one way to go. But uh, it's a good point. I, I hadn't thought of it that that far into it. I know that there was a, you know, that there was a that these structures were daylighted. So that there was going to be a portion that stuck up above above the uh, above the uh, grade, and I think maybe we can once the applicants on, they could probably elaborate on that. So if they're listening, they could probably go ahead and make a little notation there to to speak a little bit about that uh, about the heights in relation to the subterranean podium parking, and how that's going to relate to uh, to the to the final height height elevation. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, you. I will definitely address that with the applicant. Um, then I had one last question for Mr. Hay here um, about the um, so the the developer is offering us 12% uh, of their units at affordable uh, with no um, density bonus requests. Um, so so my my question is, and uh, are they doing this purely as a gift to 26 random tenants, or is there some kind of a, a other benefit they get for doing this? Well, one big benefit they get is they get a general plan amendment that changes this from commercial to mixed use, which includes residential. So that's a, a major benefit. And they get the measure E units, which has a great value as well. So um, again, this is a negotiated kind of agreement where they are they have agreed to give us the 26 uh, affordable units, which again is a benefit, I think at the end of the day to the city. Um, and that's how it's, it's listed. So uh, again, I mean, there's, they get some things and in, in, in the city gets something that's part of the, the development agreement. Gotcha. Terms. So, so um, uh, uh, give that back to me again. So we're changing the zoning for them. Correct. And what's the other thing? I'm sorry. We're, we're offering them the measure E units. And we're giving them the measure E units. Correct. And we're giving them 3 million towards improvements. And that gives us well, 26. Right. We're, giving the, we're offering the $3 million that can be spent in this location or this area, this zone area. Uh, to use a bond money for public infrastructure. You got it. Okay. All right. I uh, I appreciate all of your answers. Um, just going back to, um, I want to say Ms. White, but that's not correct. Um, did we get anything on the uh, the hazmat? Uh, Melissa Whitemore. 
Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so we act, I actually found in our files and forgive me because it's been a few months since I picked up this project, um, an EDR record search that does state which, um, you know, cleanup sites are near or on the project site. And um, it was done in 2020. Um, and there is nothing reported on the site. Perfect. Thank you so much for your work on that. I apologize for making you go back in files. Oh, no problem at all. My pleasure. All right. Um, let's see here. At this point, uh, we are going to move along to the applicant or applicant's representatives to speak. They have 15 minutes. Um, I believe the applicants are as follows. Uh, Tim Gallagher, uh, Brian Poliquin, Lee Newman, uh, Mark Sellers, and Eric Sloan. Uh, gentlemen, you have the floor. Thank you. And we are not going to take 15 minutes, Mr. Chairman. I guarantee you that. The, uh, the matter before you tonight is simply asking for approval of this specific plan, the zone change, the development agreement, and other adjustments that allow for a project that has really terrific benefits for the city of Thousand Oaks. This is an infill project on what can only be described as a blighted site in the city. It has three significant benefits for the city. One is the restoration of these historic timber school buildings, the first of them built in 1925. But these buildings have been in a state of decay for decades. And you finally have an owner who is willing to restore these buildings to their previous state of beauty and then offer them to the public for free or very low rental rates. Mark Sellers and I have been meeting with historical and cultural groups in the city who are absolutely ecstatic about this development. They worried that those buildings were going to be torn down. Two, you're developing an apartment project that is medium density. We haven't brought that up tonight. It contains only it contains 26 affordable units. You've seen the design by our architect, Brian Poliquin and his team. After consulting with the city staff, which had a bunch of great ideas about this project, this is a beautiful project. It exceeds the parking requirements. It exceeds the landscape requirements. It exceeds the public space requirements. Uh, we had a discussion a little bit earlier with Commissioner Newman about the electric charging stations. This came up kind of late in our, in our process, but if they've exceeded the standards on all those others, what makes you think they wouldn't exceed it on those? Uh, this is a project that is gonna be very good for the city, and I'm certain we will be putting our charging stations into this. And finally, and this has gotten very little attention, but this is gonna be the development of a hotel that's gonna serve many visitors to the city's burgeoning biotechnology business. I don't need to tell you that this is the economic growth engine for the city's future. And this project is going to support that growth with the hotel option that's going to be preferred by the many visitors to Amgen and the related businesses. Now, there are additional benefits for the city, and particularly for the Kelly Road HOA neighbors. Under this agreement, the developer is going to complete many of the public improvements that the city and the residents have desired for years. How do I know this? Because one of the owners, Bruce Kaufman, and I have, been, have met with the owners at least 10 times in the last four years. And one of the things that comes up all the time is how dark that intersection there is at Kelly Road and Newberry Road. How one side of Kelly Road doesn't have a sidewalk. The flooding that Mr. Fatemi mentioned earlier. All these things come up in our meetings with these neighbors. So, yes, I realize there's some money the city is making available to the developer for this. Uh, in our preliminary estimates, I can assure you that these improvements will cost a lot more than $3 million. Not that the $3 million isn't generally appreciated, but these are, this developer is going to be putting a lot of money into improving that area. Finally, this project is going to improve the site itself, which is nothing more than a decaying calamity of broken concrete and dying vegetation. We want to thank the city staff, especially the senior planner, Nazar Slim. Nazar, I understand this is one of his first projects in his new role at the city. Thank you very much. Assistant City Attorney Patrick Ayer. Uh, for their long hours and dedication to this project. I listened in on too many long conversations between attorneys, um, but we got there. And finally to Rincon as well for all their good work on this project. In the end, this is going to be a great project for the city. 
I want to turn it over to Mark Sellers to talk about uh, that agreement and any other questions. And then, of course, Brian and Lee will be around to answer any questions that staff has, or excuse me, the commissioners have. Mark? Yeah, you're on mute, buddy. I know. <laughs> All right. There you go. Hi. Um, yeah, I just want to make a couple comments. Then uh, I think the majority of the comments should be made by the architect on the site plan, the elevations, and that sort of thing. Uh, I have been involved with this site trying to get a private development, this back on the tax roll for over 30 years. About 30 years ago, the school district came to the city and said, We want to relocate the Caneo High School. We're not spending any money. Those buildings are. Uh, uh, neglected, the property is neglected, and it doesn't make sense to put a school right next to a freeway. Uh, we then tried to find a site for him. I found the Chappelle, uh, Nate Chappelle agreed to give him a site out in his industrial park. Unfortunately, the city put a natural gas facility right next to this site, and the state architect said, no way are you going to put a high school out there. So over the years, they've been trying to sell it, and we talk about this $3 million, they went to the city and said, how can you help us sell this? How can you help us get this back on the tax rolls? And the city said, all right, we've got $3 million in redevelopment funds. Find a buyer and we'll let that uh, help with the development of the site in some sort of private use. Well, we closed uh, the deal, we bought it. My client, Daylight, bought the property a number of years ago. And the first task they gave me was go to Caltrans and get Caltrans to agree that we can tear down that sound wall. The site was zoned commercial two, C2, and no retail use would go to that site with that 15 foot sound wall over the entire frontage. And you know what Caltrans told us? We like sound walls. We think they're pretty. We think they're attractive. We want to keep that. So that's when we suddenly said, it won't make sense for a commercial center. What makes sense there? And we came up with the idea, apartments, and if we can find a destination hotel that doesn't need to be seen from the freeway, but it was a, such a quality, people will call in and go there, and that kind of project makes sense. And so that's where the project is today. The hotel, if we can build it in the first phase, we will. It makes no economic sense to delay and not get this project built all in one phase. So our motivation is to get this project built as quickly as possible. With that, I'll turn it over to Brian, the architect. Okay. Um, I'm Brian Poliquin, commissioners. Um, Nazar did a great job of describing the project. I, I don't know if I should really get into too much as far as devil in the details, but basically the idea was to do a smaller buildings along the street perimeters. Um, it's a half up, half down parking, parking podium uh, with nine, nine smaller building structures atop the podium. Um, the reason why we did the half up, half down is one, it allows for natural ventilation for the parking. So we didn't have to use mechanical ventilation for the parking. And also it keeps the parking underneath the buildings. It also helps heat island effect, which would be part of the Cal Green checklist that we would deal with later on in the project. Um, the smaller buildings was an idea to reduce scale, a la, let's say, uh, think of the West Lake Inn with the small casitas lined up uh, with small walking paths in between them that are nicely landscaped. Um, thanks to Lee Newman's job of creating all those pedestrian pathways, we think it creates an intimate, scaled, um, elegant, um, mission-style project, mission revival. Uh, we looked a lot to Santa Barbara-style um, architecture as, as um, the impetus for the design of the project. Um, the hotel um, also matches the architecture, as was mentioned, and the hotel was also placed up on the street to give a little more of an urban sense as opposed to having a sea of parking. You'll notice in the site plan, there really is very little parking that's visible from the street, which I think makes a much more elegant project for people to see. And also most of the project along the perimeter is two story, not three story. We stepped the buildings um, to create that uh, smaller scale along the street. Um, the question about the half up, half down parking, um, you figure these units, usually we design them at 10, 6, 10, 6, 10, 6. So if you were three stories, you'd be um, 31 foot six from floor to basically deck. Um, sometimes we might go 11, 11, 11. Um, and then you have the subterranean, which pops up about four feet above the ground. 
Um, so just to kind of give a little bit of the way we think as far as um, putting the buildings together. Um, as far as the timber school, we used a historical preservation specialist. Um, he wrote a report and he told us how um, we would improve the building. Um, it would be in its essentially its heyday um, and that would be the way we want it to appear. And so that's the way ultimately if we, when we do the improvements on the building, when we do construction drawings, when it goes to building and safety, it will be done based on that guideline from um, the historic preservation specialist. We were always thinking the auditorium side would be more of a public space. The school building would be leasing office um, and more support for um, the apartment complex. Um, so those, those were some things I noticed that everybody was talking about. Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, I'll let Lee Newman talk a little bit about the oak trees and how, you know, the mitigation, things like that. But he, we did spend a lot of time with creating the pedestrian spaces in between the buildings. We spent a lot of time on the architecture, really trying to create a nice scale project for the street. And I think Newbury Park really does. I, I went to some of those um, meetings um, in Newbury Park about the project. And there are people that are really excited about this project and really want to see this happen. And of course, there's a real special place for the, um, the preservation of the timber school. Um, I think that's going to be a real important element. And part of that was that corner, making that corner more interesting. Um, make it a people space. It has some landscape. It has some seating and not just a blank concrete and asphalt corner like it is now. So it, it, this is really a nice upgrade to that area of Newbury Park. I think it'll be really exciting to see it uh, improved. If you have any questions of me too, I'm here. So be glad to answer. You got it. Um, is, that, uh, is that the end of your presentation then? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, then uh, thank you very much. And uh, we will go to the commissioners. Do any of my commissioners have uh, questions of the applicant? Vice Chair Newman, I see you were first. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the applicants for your presentation. I just have four questions. Uh, I think Mr. Sellers has already answered the first, but just to get it on the record, uh, do you accept condition 17 of the agreement as written? This, this is the one that says uh, there's a deed restriction on the hotel portion of the proper of the project and it can be built as a hotel. It, you can't go put apartments or a roller coaster or some other use there. Uh, do, you, do you accept that condition as written? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, we had a lot of discussion about that. The uh, client wasn't real happy about doing a deed restriction, but the fact is you have a specific plan that says only a hotel can go there, so they accepted why fight over it. We're going to put a hotel there. That's the only thing that can go there. All right, very good. Thank you. On the uh, affordable units, uh, question, um, well, question in general about the apartment side of the project now. Will the building superintendent live on site? Is that part of the plan for this? And if so, will that super occupy one of the low income apartments? I don't um, think we've answered that question yet. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, we haven't even gotten to the issue of operations, how the apartment's going to operate once they're built. So that's okay. asking um, the question only because it, it had come up in a a previous project, uh, but that project had a much lower number of uh, affordable units, so it was a more significant part of the um, of the project in that case. Okay. Uh, on the the MND, I could use some clarification with regard to solar power. Uh, there's one statement in the MND that the 2019 building standards require photovoltaic power uh, for buildings that are two stories and less. And then a few pages later, I think it says um, that's not being done here. So can you clarify where we're at with regard to solar on, on this site? Ryan, Melissa, can Melissa help on this? Melissa, can you help on that? 
to yeah, the Yeah, I'm IS. trying to look it up right now on the IS. The, the requirement part is page 51 of the MND. Thank you. Toward the bottom of the page. And I'm, I'm clear on the requirement. That That's very clearly stated. My question is, what's being done on in this project to meet that requirement? Okay, okay. Brian, can you answer? Usually what we do is we prepare the roof to accommodate. We provide space to accommodate the solar. And then as the project goes through um, construction and building, then usually we'll usually the ownership will decide whether they're going to do the solar at, at what point in time. But the building is prepared to do solar. In other words, we have to have conduit up there. We have to have all the capable connections to do it. And there has to be space to accommodate it as well. Okay, so is it an accurate statement then to say at this moment, as planned, uh, the project would be solar ready but would not use solar panels? I think that's more fair right now. Okay. And then the final question I have is the one I'd asked earlier about the replacement time, the, the replacement trees, uh, particularly those large black walnuts in front. Um, how long uh, approximately will it take for the replacement walnuts to grow to the size of the ones that we're removing for this project? So I see a square for Lee Newman, our arborist. Lee, if you can unmute right. yourself and answer that question, that'd be great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, the walnuts are a slow growing tree and they're multis where they probably won't go across the front. There'd be a couple that would be planted in the front. The size of walnuts that are available in the nurseries right now, a 24 inch box, uh, a two foot box square, maybe 30 inches high in the box. And then the plant itself probably would be six to 10 feet tall, depending on uh, availability. Uh, the market right now is uh, slim on plant materials and so forth. So we buy what we can get. Um, so that walnuts will grow fast if under irrigation and nature, they grow a little slower. So within the first year, if it's eight feet by the uh, fifth year, it would be probably 12 to 15. And, you know, it keeps going on from there. The oaks will probably grow a little, little faster than the uh, walnut trees and we can buy them bigger. Okay, so can you give me a ballpark number then on the walnuts? Let, let's say the ones out front are, I don't know, I'm, I'm guesstimating here, but I'd say they're approximately 35 to 40 feet tall. Um, yes, and they were planted planted when uh, 101, from my, my uh, recollection, when, when the uh, road 101 was going through there. And uh, I, I was involved with uh, several of the projects along uh, along the road, along the Newbury Road, and we tried to save them in the past in front of the uh, um, uh, two developments above, and I think uh, we ended up taking them out because they got brittle and became a safety hazard. Right. So to get them that big, those those big ones that are there right now have probably were planted in the 30s or 40s, you know? So, okay. So we're talking about an, about an 80 year time span then to get something like that. And, you know, that's where the biologists and I, bi biologists and I dis disagree. They are a black walnut, not California walnut. If you look in the hills, you know, the, the, the California walnut has a lanceolate leaf and a yellower, yellower flower. These are a little, or yellower, uh, yellower leaf and lanceolate. These are a little more round leaf. So without getting into an arm wrestling match with them, we will plant California walnuts on the property. Uh, those black walnuts were used a lot in the olden days because they grew relatively fast. All right, I, I'll, I'll take your, your expert uh, word for that. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chair, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Newman. Uh, following up, uh, uh, Commissioner McMahon, please. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that my fellow commissioner brought up a very good point. You do need an on-site manager um, with 16 units or more. So uh, I would really hate to lose one of those affordable units for this on-site manager. I'm just gonna throw that out there. 
Well, um, let me just say, those units are going to be restricted. We can't change it. Once they're affordable, they're always affordable for 55 years. So there's going to be an affordable housing agreement recorded against this property. Right. And so will the on-site manager have to have that that low income to live there? Is that, you know what I mean? The, the maximum income that they're required to have? Well, yes, if he's, gonna, if he's gonna live in an affordable unit, he would. Okay. If not, then he could live someone in the market rate units. So. Okay. Um, and then um, I, I had a couple questions about the EV. Um, so you're not yet determined whether you're gonna actually have them fully functioning, but you're gonna have it ready to be fully functioning. Is that correct? Uh, um, and, and that is in the hotel and the residential apartments or just one or just the other? The buildings would all be prepared for EV. So they would have conduits provided to support EV in the future. Okay, all, all both the of buildings. Them. Oh, okay, both of them. And then- it, all, it kind of falls under the Cal Green. There's a, a Cal Green list. Like this project would go under Cal Green. So there's a Cal Green checklist of things that you do to make sure that you comply to Cal Green. We would go through the items that benefit the project from a Cal Green point of view. That's usually always one of them is that we provide conduit for EVs. We um, ready the roof for solar. And then there's some other energy saving elements that we do in the project, which could be part of the HVAC systems. Um, there's heat island effect issues, which actually the subterranean parking the podium parking will help on. So all those things kind of benefit Cal Green and we use those tools uh, in getting Cal Green compliance. Okay, and, and then there was some talk about perhaps a museum or an art gallery or something going into the Timber School Auditorium. Would that be um, provided at market rate rent or would that be uh, some other benefit to this organization where it would be a lower rent? Yeah, those are still details to be determined, Commissioner McMahon, but that's exactly where the conversation has gone when Mark and I have been meeting with these groups. As you probably know, they don't have a lot of money, but to create another venue for them to have, whether it's gallery showings or perform musical or theatrical performances at low cost or no cost, would just be a great benefit to the city. So that's how we put that proposal forward as a community benefit too. And the same goes with the other building next door, uh, the classroom building or the office building. We want to see what community benefits we can offer with that as well. There are a lot of organizations that want to rent rooms, and often these places have charges of, you know, it may not be much, $200, $250, but to a nonprofit, that's, that's a decent amount of money. So those are the kind of organizations we're looking to help out. And it's your intent to uh, make it very affordable for them? Yes. Okay, thank you. And one last uh, little comment. I was really happy to see the bicycle corrals there and the bicycle racks. Thank you for that. And I'm done for now. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Uh, Commissioner Lanson, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair Newman. I just, I'm sorry, Chair Buss. <laughs> I just have a few questions. Um, initially, we've been talking about the density bonus that I guess you're, you're quote unquote giving up, so to speak. And I'm just curious, how many additional fair market units would you have been entitled to had you claimed that Right. I don't know if you know that, Mr. Gallery, Mr. Sellers, but I'm just curious about what the number would be. We, we, we didn't even calculate that because once you get into the density bonus, then you get in the issue of what kind of enticements is the city going to give us? Are they going to reduce the parking standards? Are they going to reduce this standard? That So we didn't want to get into that discussion with the city. So we didn't even look at a density bonus. We said, we'll do a straight project. We'll meet all the city standards and handle it, the development that way. Okay, and in furtherance of that, uh, Mr. Sellers, uh, I know uh, Vice Chair Newman asked you whether or not you were in agreement with, with Section 17. I'll just ask the general question. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, Mr. Sellers, are you guys in agreement with the rest of the conditions provided in the report? Yes, yes we are. I have nothing further, Chair Boss. Thank you, Commissioner Lanson. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, Mr. Gallagher, at the beginning of this, you said something about free units. Uh, what were you referring to? Commissioner Buss, I'm not sure where I said that, but if I if I did, I was mistaken. I don't 
I think there are free units. Copy that. Uh, second thing, you name checked a gentleman by the name of Bruce Kaufman. Is who is yes. he, and how is he involved? Oh, sorry, he is uh, one of the owners of the project. Is that uh, Kaufman from uh, Kaufman and Broad? No, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> neighborhood storage. If you know the storage building on uh, Teo Boulevard. Oh yes. Okay. Boulevard Road. That's I, was, I was just curious who we were name checking here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then I have a question for the arborist, um, Mr. Newman, I believe. Um, the tree border that's going to be along the southern end of the property. Um, what uh, it said at maturity, those plants or trees will be 25 feet high. At inception, how tall will they be? Uh, I, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I think uh, what we had planned on is a 24 inch box, you know, and we gave uh, uh, Nazir some, some, some species. It'll depend on the market. So about eight when feet? We plant, when we plant a 24 inch box, it could be 12, 10 to 12 feet. Uh -huh. Again, the, the market right now is, is, uh, is uh, stretched as far as uh, the plant material. So we had recommended some natives that wouldn't require a lot of water uh, because we, and then we wanted something evergreen in that back area also so we could uh, curtail the view from the homeowners uh, on the existing houses also. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh. Thank and you. then, and then, Mr. Polquin, I had a question about the uh, the EV ready um, idea. Uh, the question I would have is is um, so you'll be EV ready, but we won't have the actual infrastructure in place unless it proves that the market demands it. Does that mean that you'd be installing um, EV chargers and stuff like that as a, a a premium for a tenant? Like that would be like an additional cost to their to their rent. Like if if you wanted a unit and an electric charger, then your your rent would be whatever, X I, plus Y. I haven't seen it done that way before. I've done other mixed use projects. Um, so then, and, so then, what, 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 how have you seen it done before? I guess would be my question. Uh, the way I've seen it done before, they put the EV chargers in. They provide a certain amount of EV chargers uh, in the project, um, and then there's a couple of EV chargers that actually can only be used by handicap. That's another uh, part of the equation. So if you do offer EV charges, there is an EV charger, depending on the number of parking spaces that you have to provide for handicap. And that of course can't be used by anybody but a disabled person. So, um, but uh, I, there, there isn't a specific number. They don't have a specific number related to parking spaces. And most of the projects that I've done, uh, they do put them in but they usually pick a number and they put them in and then they provide, they do it per code. Once, once you pick the number, then you follow code to do it. Okay, perfect. And then um, I, 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 you probably heard me ask uh, Mr. Slim earlier about the uh, underground parking relative to the, uh, uh, where the first floor begins. I think your clarification was it would be four feet above uh, ground Roughly. level. Roughly. Roughly the grade feet. may move, move, it won't be a lot of difference, but roughly about four feet okay. above grade. Copy that. All right, perfect. I think that is all of my questions. Um, so, Chair Buss? Yes, sir. Uh, if I may, uh, this is, I want to bring this up right now simply because um, Commissioner Lanson mentioned it again on the conditions, and he asked a question to the applicants about whether they accept the conditions. When he first spoke, Mr. Lanson mentioned um, condition number three and uh, the date time of condition number three, which says July 6, 2024. And obviously there's been a disconnect with that condition. I apologize to the DA because um, I will just state that uh, the parties in negotiating the DA spent a, a lot of time on, on this date. And so I would like to modify that condition number three, if I may, and then uh, so we're clear about the date starting time because it is very specific for them due to the possibility of two phases. All right. Okay. So the condition number three would instead read the above reference permits are granted for the period set forth in section 5.7 of the development agreement number 2020-70273, which provides for the development to be inaugurated on or before March 1st, 2025 and if broken into two phases the second phase must be started on or before march 1st 2027 those were specific dates that were requested by uh, the applicant in this um, project 
All right. Thank you, sir. And so I just would like, if you could, if you can ask applicants if they agree with that. And again, it's, it goes to section 5.7 of the DA. All right. I will ask Mr. Gallagher, is that acceptable to you, sir? Well, yes, that's, that's what we negotiated and talked about. Those were the correct dates. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That Thank you, Chief like, Us. Sounds like we're all good. All right. Then at this point, um, what I'd like to do is uh, move on to public comments. We have, I believe, 12 public speakers this evening. So each speaker will have three minutes. Um, and uh, I would ask that all of the, the speakers, as I call your name, if you will actually repeat your name and your city of residence, uh, just for the public record, I would greatly appreciate it. And so we will begin with uh, Rosanna Guerra. You have the floor. Good evening. My name is Rosanna Guerra, and I've been a resident of Thousand Oaks since 1993. I wanted to voice my opinion on going forward with the Timber School project. Due to the lack of housing in the area, I would hope that the Planning Commission would expedite its approval and not be hindered by the developer waiting for approval of the hotel. I've been an advocate for affordable housing since the general plan has been undertaken by the city and primarily looking at housing that is sustainable for older adults and those with disability. Older adults are one of the fastest growing demographics and also the fastest growing in homelessness. With the rising cost of healthcare and downsizing by companies, older adults find themselves in an economic downturn. Social security that cannot pay the rent or mortgage or health insurance. It is for those reasons I believe that developers need incentives to create greater affordable housing, not just for older adults, but also for working families in our community. Equally important is for the City of Thousand Oaks to work closely with any new developers to create pathways that emphasize the principles of universal design. Create designs in an environment so that it can be access, accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. An environment, in this case, a building, should be designed to meet the needs of all people who wish to use it, paying particular attention to how older adults and the disabled can access the entrance, grab bars, access to light switches, items that able-bodied individuals take for granted for a challenge for older adults or the disabled. Your home should be easily accessible no matter what your physical abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guerra. I believe her city residence was Thousand Oaks. Um, once again, I'd like to repeat, if you can uh, tell us your city of residence when, uh, when you begin speaking. Our next speaker is Danielle Borja. Good evening, Chair Buss and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Danielle Borgia, Thousand Oaks resident and President CEO of the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber of Commerce. Our organization represents more than 800 businesses in the Conejo Valley. Over half of these businesses are located in Thousand Oaks. On behalf of our board of directors, I would like to offer support for the Daylight Thousand Oaks projects before you this evening. Our business community is in dire need of more workforce housing and options for their employees. The proposed 218 units will help the city meet its arena numbers, both for workforce housing as well as low income housing. This development will also be attractive housing for our local employees, including our growing biotech sector. According to the recent Biocom report, in 2020, over 8,000 people in Ventura County were directly employed by life science companies, supporting over 20,000 jobs in the region. With the biotech hub growing, those numbers are increasing, and this project location is very convenient for those working in the Rancho Conejo area. The new boutique hotel will help meet the future demand for both leisure and corporate travel in Thousand Oaks, especially for the needs of our biotech community. The infrastructure improvements will benefit Thousand Oaks residents. If you have driven by this site lately, you know the current condition and the visual benefit this beautiful project will bring to that local area. And finally, a developer will be preserving the two timber school buildings and repurposing them for community benefit, adding further character to the project. I actually learned recently from my 91-year-old grandfather that my dad went to timber school when they first moved to Thousand Oaks in the late 60s. We urge you to approve the project before you this evening that will provide benefits to both our business community and the community at large. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Gordon Clint. You have the floor. Yeah, good evening, commissioners. You hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I, I had to unmute twice. Um, my name is Gordon Clint. Uh, I live in Newbury Park, and uh, I am a member of the Caneo Climate Coalition. This is a very exciting project. There's so much that I like in this proposed development. There's 218 apartments, uh, including the 26 affordable. Thousand Oaks and Newbury Park in particular really need housing that is affordable. Hopefully, greenhouse gases from commuting uh, can be reduced when more people who work here can actually live here. So um, I support approval of the land use aspects um, involved, at, but and the architectural, all that is, re is really great. But I ask you to uh, revise the MND. Please don't adopt or certify the, MN, the unrevised mitigated negative declaration because it's, it's clear to me that climate and environmental sustainability measures were not adequately considered. The uh, MND uh, should consider building uh, all electric. Modern heat pump, HVAC and water heating systems are more efficient than gas and will save money for both the owner and the tenants over the long run. The uh, swimming pool can be heated by uh, solar thermal, um, and uh, uh, it's good to hear that uh, the, the roofs are gonna be solar uh, photovoltaic ready, but um, uh, I'd like, I would really prefer that, that they would actually be built at the same time, and, uh, but anyhow. Regarding the EVs, um, I have a, a little bit different take on that. Um, I, I think one parking space for each apartment should actually have electrical conduit and wire uh, from their unit's electric meter to a box at their parking space so EV chargers can be added as needed. And I, I feel basic uh, sustainability measures uh, make good business sense as as you've done so many other good things, the developer has done so many other good things in this proposal. But uh, um, the, uh, as we uh, ad adapt to the, the worsening conditions of the climate crisis, we really need to get serious and, and do more, make more sustainable, more climate friendly. Um, as an investor, I would not want to spend money on gas infrastructure, which may be obsolete in the near future. And as a renter, um, if I was a renter, I would prefer an electric magnetic induction cooktop. Um, I've tried one, they've worked great. I suggest that uh, you all try them if you haven't. They're safer, cook well, and um, avoid the unhealthy indoor gas pollution you get from uh, gas appliances. You got it, thank okay. you, Mr. Clint. Okay. <laughs> all right, our next speaker is going to be Isabel Feinblum. Ms. Feinblum isn't present. All right. Follow along with Jackson Piper, please. Uh, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. My name is Jackson Piper. I am a resident of unincorporated Newbury Park. I've uh, been here since 1991. And um, I am also a housing advocate with Ventura County Yimby and involved with the uh, Thousand Oaks Livability Action Network. Um, I really appreciate the attention to detail in the architecture of this project. I think it is a, a very beautiful project. Um, and I think the 218 units are, uh, are a very good addition, uh, especially with the 26 of them being affordable. Um, for low incomes in this city. We really need a lot more housing and a lot more housing oriented towards people who really can't afford to uh, to pay the high market rates that we have in this city and throughout Ventura County. Um, I know it was already addressed by the applicant a little bit, but I'm curious as to why 
uh, density bonus was not sought in this project um, because it would, uh, under AB 2345, with, uh, I believe, around a 20% increase or 20 percent uh, delivery of affordable units the project could increase by 50 percent um, the total number of units provided so uh, you know I'm, I'm a housing advocate I'd love to see more affordable housing um, as much as possible included in projects and if that means that more market rate gets built along with it I'm perfectly fine with that so I'm wondering why uh, why the density bonus was not sought um, I'm also wondering um, about the parking arrangement of the property. Um, I can't help but notice as, a, as someone who's an urban planner, how much of the property is occupied by pavement for vehicles. Um, I think the subterranean garages are, are a great thing uh, to reduce the amount of pavement, but I'm wondering why, you know, if there was any consideration of uh, making those subterranean garages go down several more levels and reducing the actual surface parking on the project. I know that's, that's an expense, but if you're going down one level, I'm wondering why not go down further. Um, let's see, I'm also uh, wondering whether it would be possible to have some kind of commercial frontage or some kind of continuation, given that there's commercial frontage to the east and the west on the, the frontage of Newbury Road. Uh, if I'm a pedestrian walking along Newbury Road as, you know, as a shopper, um, I kind of worried that there's going to be a, a gap in between where those two commercial areas are and that might be a problem uh, for walkability. Um, one last question. I love the, the wind towers that I see in the renderings. I'm wondering if those are actually functional or if those are just aesthetic. Uh, aesthetic. Uh, I think if they're functional, that would be an amazing environmental addition to this project. Thank you and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Piper. And our next uh, speaker is uh, William Maple. You have the floor, sir. Hello, just checking to see if you can hear me. Yes, we can. William Maple, resident, Newberry Park, uh, members of the commission. I moved up from Orange County about 35 years ago, mainly because this valley made a priority to preserve the open space and our amazing vistas. Um, few residents that I've talked to endorsed a new move toward taller, more compacted development. I understand the market forces that are pushing this direction. I have three adult children who tell me they cannot afford our local definition of affordable housing. After the school district sold Canela High School, I attended the zoning and rezoning meetings. And um, that was the time to make your voice heard. Unfortunately, less than a handful of residents did. Now we're down to the road several years and the property sits vacant. It's time to take action and finalize any mitigation issues. My main concern is for the preservation of the county and city landmarks. In the future, I hope you will include the county cultural heritage board in any discussions just to ensure there's a, a second party looking at CEQA standards. I submitted a PDF earlier today, and I'm not sure if it, it arrived, but I'd like it included in the record. It just highlights some of the heritage of the school. It is the oldest public use building uh, still standing in the Caneo, and for nearly a century, timber served our community, including many of the founders, such as the Hayes, Orchard, and Jantz families. As far as I know, it's the only two-room schoolhouse of its kind remaining in California. It was built in 24 or 40 years before TL became a city. I attended the um, early planning meetings provided by daylight representatives, one hosted at the Caneo Valley Historical Society, and they were very open to the public and the representatives listened patiently. And I know that's not easy to resident concerns. And the city planners were present and they contribute to the discussion. I feel the planning department has worked diligently to shape this project for the better. And I believe the architect, Mr. Pelican, um, understands the community and will produce the best balanced solution that he can. Again, my concern is for the two landmarks. I, I don't understand a lot of the ramifications of the development, but the 1924 Timber Schoolhouse has survived the Great Depression, World War II, a number of recessions, and even a pandemic. 
has been maintained over the years to ensure it wasn't a danger to the children. So it's not quite the bad shape that everybody describes. It's the used car you want to buy. And this site has uh, been well documented. Um, it's past and it's obvious value to the heritage of our community. I believe the project will um, not only preserve both landmarks, but more importantly, restore them for future generations. In less than three years, Timber will celebrate its 100th anniversary, Thousand Oaks its 60th. After the past two miserable years, I hope we can all, will be able to celebrate both events in an open and restored Timber School. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maple. And our next speaker is uh, fellow Lancer, Clint Fultz. Hello, my name is Clint Fultz. I live in Thousand Oaks and I'm a member of the Caneo Climate Coalition. I'd like to start by providing some context for what I'm going to say here tonight. So hopefully you guys can uh, bear with me. A recent study from Cornell University titled Greater Than 99% Consensus on Human-Caused Climate Change in the Peer-Reviewed Scientific Literature found that more than 99.9% .9 of peer-reviewed scientific papers agree that climate change is mainly caused by humans, according to a new survey of 88,125 climate-related studies. I'll quote Benjamin Holton, co-author of the study. It's critical to acknowledge the principal role of greenhouse gas emissions so that we can rapidly mobilize new solutions since we are already witnessing in real time the devastating impacts of climate-related disasters on businesses, people, and the economy, end quote. A paper soon to be published in the Economic Journal of the Royal Economic Society concluded that the costs of inaction on climate were far greater than the costs of action and that the climate crisis was the biggest market failure in history. Meanwhile, five young adults are on day six of a hunger strike in front of the White House, demanding that our representatives deliver on their elected mandate and pass climate policy that matches the urgency and the scale of the climate emergency. This project at Timber School site could be built in a way that matched the urgency and the scale of the climate emergency. But after doing my best to read the 141 page Daylight Department's final initial study MND document with my limited time, I don't see how dangerous gas lines, the lack of solar panels with battery backup in the plan, and potentially low amount of EV charging stations meets the urgency of the climate crisis. Perhaps this plan can be amended. So many of the elements of this project are great and would benefit the community. I truly appreciate the affordable housing, bicycle racks, and other amenities. But we need to green light the development of projects in our city that will meet the climate crisis at hand. Electrified buildings, solar power and battery storage, and an adequate number of EV charging stations are a must. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fultz. Our next speaker is Roseanne Witt. You have the floor. Good evening, Chair Buss and Commissioners. My name is Roseanne Witt with the Conejo Climate Coalition. I live in Thousand Oaks. California's solar mandate codified by Assembly Bill 178 and effective January 1st, 2020, requires solar panels on all multifamily residents this is up to three stories high. In signing the law, Governor Newsom cited the fact that residences with solar panels are more resilient to power outages have increased value and save property owners tens of thousands of dollars in energy costs over time. While page 51 of the mitigated negative declaration for the Daylight Project acknowledges this mandate, page 69 of the same document states, quote, oh, excuse me, the project's site plans do not include on-site PV solar panels. Therefore, it was not assumed that the project's electricity usage would be supplied by any PV solar panels. Are we to read that to mean solar panels will not be installed on this project? It's no coincidence that the governor focused on grid reliability in his signing statement. In our climate-changed world of extreme heat, hotter, faster wildfires, flash flooding from atmospheric rivers, mudslides along burn scars, and recurrent power outages, reliability is on residents and policymakers' minds alike. Developing, incentivizing, and requiring local microgrids, both public and private, which combines solar generation with battery storage to protect, protect residents and businesses from power interruptions, especially during emergency events, 
has become both a logical and necessary public health, safety, and resilience strategy. The local control and reliable power which microgrids provide not only reduce the need for first responder assistance, but also ensure uninterrupted operation of communications, cell phone charging, life-saving medical equipment, and temperature control for people and medications alike, as well as other essential services requiring a continuous, reliable source of energy. The city should maximize solar rooftop installation and battery storage citywide to increase distributed rooftop clean energy generation and resiliency during power outages and emergency conditions. If this project is approved without requiring these now essential health, safety, and resiliency mitigation measures, our community will miss a critical opportunity and our city will have failed its obligation to the people it is supposed to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Patterson. Mr. Patterson, are you there? Can you guys hear me? Now I can hear you. There we go. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Um, but my, this is Robert Patterson. I live in Newberry Park, and I am a Galway resident. Um, Isabel Fine, Feinblum is also one. Uh, she She's actually watching you guys on YouTube right now, but uh, she didn't get the link right. Um, but, uh, yeah, just as a resident, um, it's been very difficult for us. Some of the comments that have been made of the property being blighted in sight, under, but that's been under Daylight's ownership, being called decaying concrete and dying vegetation, that's been under Daylight's ownership. We bought our homes next to a school. Um, and so for these comments to be made, how much they're improving our place, it's under their ownership that it's become what it currently is. Um, I'm asking that any building within 100 feet of the Galway property line be restricted to two stories. I know they did that to the buildings that are within 60, but um, my own personal house, it's gonna be within 80 feet and we're gonna have a house that's looking down. Um, the sound and light pollution from these uh, structures of all those parking lot spaces with the hundreds of cars going to and from, that's 30 feet from our back doors. That's not just across the street, that's from our backyard, from our door to our house. Um, and so I'm requesting that they would build up the retaining wall to become an actual um, sound wall because that would stop the sound, the light pollution. Uh, they mentioned 10 to 12 foot trees to stop that, that are gonna take decades to grow. That is simply um, not adequate. Um, and I think it's inconsiderate for us. Um, I think the parking spaces are severely limited. Um, a concern is for the timber school, what happens if there's an event? Where do those people park if there's an event at the timber school space? Um, if it's a Friday night and people have friends over, where are they going to park? Um, I know it's 19 more than what's required, um, but if you've driven by any apartment complex, you know they park in the street and we are the street they're gonna be parking next to. We're already medium use. Um, I recommend that the city require more parking spaces. If you want to dig down deeper, whatever that is, um, that's fine. And then my last personal comment is that um, limit the hours of construction. You're talking about three plus years of construction. Once again, next to our house is in our backyards. Um, we have kids, we have all that stuff. Um, and then lastly, Isabel, she wanted me to pass on the comment that she desires that anything being built be green active, not just green ready. Um, you've heard a lot of comments about that. That matters to a lot of residents. But I'm um, just speaking on behalf of the neighborhood. We get uh, about a week's notice of these meetings. And for many of us, we're, we're working professionals. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Faith Grant. You have the floor. Good evening, uh, Chairman Buss and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Faith Grant and I live in Westlake Village and I am also a representative of the Caneo Climate Coalition. Um, I would like to ask if someone tonight uh, could provide the exact website where these NMDs can be found because it is challenging finding things on the TO side. Um, while the Caneo Climate Coalition commends representatives of the Day Like Apartments Project for their outreach to the Thousand Oaks community, the project is not designed for a city and world oriented toward climate change solutions. 
As we see our federal government shrink from taking bold climate action, it's a relief that the city of Thousand Oaks Sustainability Department is creating a climate action plan that will ultimately impact the general plan update and its building standards. The problem is we're running out of time and it is incumbent on the Planning Commission with its responsibility for reviewing and deciding applications for commercial and residential development to make sustainable building requirements of the builder and to the City Council for this Daylight Apartments project. The project touts water efficient fixtures and landscaping, energy efficient heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, roof overhangs for solar shading, and drip irrigation. However, these are common features that do not make this a sustainable building. The project does not exceed sustainability standards, but it sounds like tonight the beauty of the design is far more important. CCC is advocating an all electric building coupled with solar panels and batteries. The current design continues to install the more costly and pollutant heavy dual system of gas and electricity. The NMD cites the pollutants from gas cooking and heating and the impact on children and seniors. Why is gas included? By the time this project construction is completed, it will most likely be out of compliance with Title IV 24 building standards and will become yet another structure required to undergo expensive retrofitting. And the NMD has conflicting wording on solar panels for structure three stories and under. If the state requires solar panels, solar panels, they need to be in stock. Also missing are an adequate number of EV charging stations for the apartments and hotel. With a total of 554 parking spaces and 51 charging spaces, it demonstrates a lack of awareness of the existing trend in electric vehicles and the 2035 state mandate banning gas vehicle sales, a mere 14 years away. I would encourage the builder to install a conduit for all underground parking permitting for future installation of charging station. Our city continues to face ongoing severe drought and water scarcity. This project provides a crucial opportunity to install a gray water reuse system for irrigation now, rather than requiring expensive retrofit at a later date. Why isn't this water conservation measure re should be required? From a financial standpoint, by neglecting to include water and energy efficiency upgrades, this building as proposed will be more expensive to build and operate and less desirable for renters who expect a healthy pollutant-free living environment and amenities for electric vehicles, bikes, and scooters. Future renters will be burdened with higher gas utility bills. As Thank gas you, Ms. Grant. We have to move along. I apologize. Okay. Our next speaker is Betsy Connolly. Hi, this is Betsy Connolly. I live in unincorporated uh, uh, Lynn Ranch. And uh, I like the project and I appreciate the work that has gone into it. And I think it will be very appealing to the residents who will uh, ultimately live there. Uh, many of the comments I had were made by others, so I'll fill in a few blanks. Uh, we hear a lot in these planning commission meetings and city council meetings about mandates and market forces. And it always seems like the mandates are talked about with resentment and the market forces are talked about with a bit of a shrug and an eye roll. Um, and I think it's important for us to be as future focused as possible with every project that comes in front of the Planning Commission and the City Council from here on out. And that, that means recognizing that the residents of this apartment building and the next apartment building and the one after that are going to appreciate the common areas and they're going to enjoy the open spaces and the parking being placed underneath, making it appealing. Those are all great things and I applaud them being part of this project. It will be a lovely place to live. Uh, but uh, many of these residents are going to want electric cars. They're younger 
than everyone on the screen, including myself. And they are, they are going to be future focused themselves. And it is a little bit alarming uh, that uh, the the EV and the solar and uh, the other state mandates are only being implemented to the mandate, not to the future residents of the city. And so I know this project is, is going to go forward. I, I think it should go forward, but I think it should be a reminder to all of us that um, somewhere along the line, we are going to have to start taking responsibility as a city for focusing on the future and investing in the things that we know are best for the environment, best for the residents of the city. And before I get off, I'd just like to give a shout out to native plants, please. Not only are they water wise, uh, but they require fewer pesticides. They do better in our terrible hot summers. And there's every reason to believe we're gonna have a lot more of them. So uh, um, let's, let's at least put in landscaping that is uh, meant to live here in our environment instead of going back to the old tired ideas that we've seen all around town in the past. And that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Connolly. Our last speaker on this uh, matter is Rob Adams. You have the floor. All right, thank you for um, allowing me time to uh, speak to the board here. <clears throat> I wanted to say initially about, there was a lot of discussion about that $3 million bond. And I can tell you that um, for me and my wife, as we walk around this neighborhood, because I live here in Newberry Park, actually in Kelly Park and the neighborhood right behind this development, uh, we won't have to walk in the street because that's what we have to do now in order to get past that old school. Um, additionally, um, one of the things I am concerned about is just hoping that the developers can, um, I'm hoping that the developers can simultaneously build both of these projects at the same time. Because if you add the three years that it's gonna take to build the apartments, and then another two years to build the hotel, if those aren't done simultaneously, then we'll be here in this neighborhood dealing with construction for five years altogether. So that's another one of my big um, things that I'm really worried about. And finally, um, it's traffic. Right now, if you were to drive down Newberry Road and just trying to get to my house, you will see people meandering all over the place, looking at the retail buildings that are um, just south of this development. Now you're gonna have additional people trying to pull into two of the new openings that are coming off of Newberry Road, because there's one there that's already there, but it's not used that much. But now it's gonna be used quite a bit more because of the probably 600 different trips a day by those residents there as well as the uh, people that are moving and pulling into the hotel. So we're gonna have Kelly Road with a light, the hotel entrance, and then a, an entrance into the apartment complex, as well as an entrance into uh, where Chili's is and where the Marriott is. So then you have all of these different entrances all along this road, so I'm hoping and I think the gentleman was on here today, and he was from the um, um, transportation department, that they're going to do a big study on where all these cars are going to go. Different striping needs to be done. The median strip is way too wide. There should be some more space there for cars to pull in and out. And that's really what I'm, what I'm hoping for when it comes to this. This project looks beautiful. So a lot more people there are going to be than I really would want to be, but I know it's going to be improvement overall. So thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. All right, I believe that is all of our speakers. So uh, we will go back to staff for follow-up comments at this point.
Thank you, Chairman Buss. Um, just to kind of touch on a couple things, uh, I think somebody mentioned um, density, uh, density bonus. Uh, one of the things is if they had elected to do the density bonus, that is the applicant, um, it would have pushed a lot of the other development standards sort of uh, to the limits in terms of trying to accommodate the additional units on site. Um, I know somebody also mentioned something about um, the height of the buildings. And I just wanted to reiterate, I don't know if there was if there was a disconnect there, but the any building, any building mass that's within 70 feet of the property line to the south would be limited to two stories, um, as mentioned before. Uh, and that was in the presentation. So really, if, uh, if it goes up to three stories, that building mass needs to be at least uh, 71 feet away before it, it can do that. Uh, and so that that was uh, that was a requirement or a restriction, if you will, uh, for all the the buildings uh, facing the south property line, or the, uh, the residents to the south, as, as mentioned. Uh, last, I think there was been a lot of talk about photovoltaics, uh, and I know uh, we do have somebody here from Buildings uh, Dragos, and he could he could speak to that. But it is a requirement of buildings, you know, two stories and under that they have uh, photovoltaic cells. So. Again, at the time of the building permit, uh, when that does come through, that will be a code requirement. They would have to meet that uh, and have those uh, photovoltaic cells in place. I don't know how much uh, kilowatts that'll generate for the entire site. It will definitely take a port, you know, uh, address a portion of the site. Um, I think lastly, there was one other comment uh, I wanted to come. Well, that, I think that was pretty much it for, for that. Um, yeah, and it escapes me for now. So if somebody wants to refresh my memory, I, I'll, I'll be happy to, to respond if I can. But uh, that that's all I have at, at this point. Thank you, Chairman Buss. Thank you. Mr. Ayer, did you want to speak as well? Thank you, Chair Buss. Just, uh, you heard some comments today in the public comments regarding um, the MND. Uh, a couple of things to, to point out. Uh, most of the comments were about what they wish could have been in the MND as far as additional uh, for example, all electric um, and um, you know, no gas, that type of thing. And it's very important for the MND for you to understand that this is an evaluation of the environmental impacts of the project as presented. And one, I'm going to tell you that in reviewing the, the MND, I think it's legally defensible to uh, from what they did. So that's an important part. And two, yes, it's not going to look at, you know, um, all the things that might have been uh, requested by a person or a group, uh, such as all electric, but it doesn't mean that the MND is flawed for that. It just means that the, the MND is definitely meeting the requirements of this of CEQA when it did this analysis. And so when it talks about uh, greenhouse gases, when it talks about um, solar, all those things, it's looking at what are the requirements for this area, and it did that very well. And that's why um, I believe the MND again for staff's recommendation is to recommend approval of them and D. So again, just to be clear, some of the comments that you heard in the public comments were about the MND, but it really was more about what they wish the MND had or what they wish we could have on the project versus the, the actual environmental part of it, the environmental analysis part. Thank you. And with your permission, Chairman, uh, I did yes, recall please. just because uh, uh, Mr. Harris spoke about the uh, MND. The question that came up or, or, or somebody cited that there was some contradiction there. One was that the MND calls out that the project will be, will have to, by, by code, will have to have solar voltaic cells. But then the other subsequent pages says that because the site plan doesn't show photovoltaics, there is assumption that there isn't gonna be any. And it does that because the MND cannot make assumptions based on what's presented in the project. And in this case, this is an entitlement stage. The entitlement isn't going to have that level of detail to show actual photovoltaics on top of the rooftops. It's going to have to be very generalized in terms of you know building massing, setbacks, et cetera. And so that that portion of the detail was left out, and the MND does not make those assumptions. And that's all that was that 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 basically that uh, paper was only citing the fact that the site plan presented did not picture the photovoltaic there or did not indicate that, but it doesn't negate the need or the requirement for the photovoltaics. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That explanation actually helps me. Uh, Vice Chair Newman, uh, it looks like you have a question of staff. I do. Two questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to be sure, Mr. Slim, I understand crystal clear what you just said, 
I think you just said that a building permit will not be issued unless there are photovoltaic solar cells on the roofs of the, at least the two-story apartments. Is that correct? Well, th thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, to be, to be, you know, honest here, I, I've got to say I'm not a building official, so I can't really speak to that level of, of specificity, specifics. But I do want to say that um, in the building code, there are requirements and there are ways to either meet that requirement or to do something that is in lieu of. And again, we do have somebody here from buildings, so I can't say the building permit won't be issued, but I do know that it is a requirement of, and it is a new code of uh, California code, uh, the building pool that, that, that uh, photovoltaics are required of single family and I guess two stories and below. And so this we have uh, Dragos here again, if he's still here, he can, he can better address that. Yes, Dragos. solar panels will be required for this project. Very good, thank you, sir. And then my other question is about one of the other asks during public comments was for a running conduit, I guess, to each parking space. So I guess, I guess the thinking is uh, if, if uh, an apartment tenant has an EV, that it, the electric usage could be metered per apartment or something like that. And I understand and I agree with what Mr. Heher's comments about why the MND is not the appropriate place for a requirement like that. Um, my question is, if it's not in the MND, where, where else would be the appropriate place to get um, some some uh, better or more clearly defined EV charging capacity in place for this project? I think so. Thank you. Okay. I think the architect touched a little bit on this in terms of it's being market driven. The other facet of that would be something that the buildings department might want to want to address. Um, and I think if I heard this correctly, providing infrastructure conduit for each parking space, I, I think would be cost prohibitive. I, I don't know. I don't, don't want to speak too much to the applicant, but there is usually an array of, of charging stations set aside and in, in, in most uh, most most of the current or contemporary apartment complexes. There's usually an array. It's either, you know, two, two to four to five, just depending on on the on the number. And I think the architect touched on that. But if the architect wants to elaborate on that or if uh, if Dragos does, that might be appropriate at this time. Yeah, I'm particularly interested in what what the code requires, what we can do to so code, right? Uh, so to, to do this. Yeah, yes, the green building code requires has a based on the number of actual parking spaces, uh, the number of required charging spaces. So, for instance, from one to nine, I'm I'm just looking at the table right now. Mm -hmm. From zero to nine requires zero. From ten to twenty-five requires one charging space. From 26 to 52 charging spaces. So there's a, a the green building code has a ratio for um, again this is um, EV charger ready only doesn't require actually to have the EV charger. Yeah, if I if I may, Chair Bus, I think one of the things that's happening here is we're getting into very very specific aspects of solar or electricity where I think the general rule is going to be that they have to follow the building code when the project is ready to go, once they submit that, whatever the building code is gonna say, is gonna be reviewed, right? We're gonna have engineers review it, public works review it, planners review it, the building officials review it, whatever that code requirements are gonna be. So I think we might be struggling a little bit here with exactly what would be required based on hypotheticals of how many we have. I, I, I guess we're, I'm just a little concerned that we might, be, we might be going too much, too deep into what's right now even versus what's going to happen with the building codes that require the time that this project is ready to go. I think, to clarify, if I may, uh, to clarify, Mr. Heher, I'm, I'm not asking for a specific requirement for a conduit to each parking space. I'm, I'm asking because there is no requirement for any chargers at all, which is my understanding right now, if there's anything in the code that would require what Dr. Connolly earlier said would be to, to make the building more future ready. Um, we, sh we are not and should not be designing from the dais. Right, and I think my comment was, I think I've heard from the applicants, they're very, 
understanding that they want to make sure this is a market driven you know project right they want to have if it's appropriate for them they were, they're going to put in EV facilities because that makes sense for them. Uh, solar, if it makes sense for them. I think the code definitely requires, it has to be ready to have those things. I know that's what the code says for sure, but I guess my concern is that we might be jumping over ourselves and do, oh, it's gonna need this many solar or this many parking spaces that are EV connected, ready to go. And I'm not sure the code says that right now. I, that's where I'm, I guess I'm a little concerned. I think it's gonna be ready for that stuff. And then I think as, uh, as any developer of commercial and um, um, residential, if it makes sense that they, they think it's going to be a, a, a benefit to the to the residents, going to attract customers or patrons or or residents to their location, I think they're going to say, yeah, it makes sense to put in whatever number it's going to be. I think it's very important though to remind them that once the building is re one, once they're ready to go with their permits, that's when we're going to look at the building codes, what's going to be applicable at the time, what what is required by the code, and they're going to have to comply with that. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair, that's all I have. You got it. I just want to follow up with what Mr. Hager is saying and say, um, I understand what you're saying, but I think that a number of the public comments basically iterated that um, it is not necessarily the market that does encourage the, the most beneficial future development, and that that is something that has be, been an issue historically, and uh, a generation significantly younger than any of us on this are the ones who are going to be victims of it and the ones that are going to be incumbent on them to change. And so I think Mr. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Newman was asking the question he was asking because he's asking, what is the venue for these, these kind of things? We're being asked to approve something as a citizens oversight group, but the questions that we have are, how will this benefit our children, our grandchildren? We're ask, these people are asking to build a building that will live um, the, one of the existing structures is nearly 100 years old. So after all of us are dead and buried, the question is, how much of that building will be useful? How much of that will be uh, a part of, of, of the fabric of this community over the uh, coming decades? So um, in following up with Mr. Newman's question, my question to you, Mr. A here, would be, um, what is the platform for the city establishing these kind of criteria in the future. I know that we're not going to be doing it this evening, but the question I think he was asking is, what is the process for the city to try to create some of these, these criteria so that we can use them to evaluate projects in the future? And, I, and Chair Buss, I think that's a great question. And Mr. Newman, again, you know, I'm not questioning your, you know, your thought process at all. I'm just saying that I think we're, we get lost sometimes with trying to get too specific when we we need that we know that we're going to follow the building codes at the time that their project is ready to go. I would say this, Mr. Uh, Chair Bus, that when we look at this, this is state driven. These building codes are going to be straight state driven. And every, I, th I believe it's every three years, and Dragos could correct me if I'm wrong, but approximately every three years, we look at the new building codes and we, and we adopt new building codes. And there are times in which we can modify those codes to some degree based on specific findings of our location, being in Southern California. Uh, we have some ability to modify that if we make specific findings. And that is the time period in which we are looking at these things. And so I think statewide, it's going to be, it's going to drive the, the regulations, for example, more EV, most solar, uh, wind, uh, great water even, whatever those factors are, that's going to be driven at state level. And that's going to go into those building codes that we then adopt as they come around every three years. So I think that's the, the, the process that we would have and that we had had in the past that answers the question, which I hope it does. That does. Um, I also just want a brief soapbox moment here for any members of the public that are paying attention. Um, also, uh, your local city council members are capable of creating forward-thinking legislature, and that can be something that can be brought in front of them. Is that not correct, Mr. Ayer? Absolutely. And again, um, you know, one of the things that they do with, with these uh, uh, building codes is that they look, again, very specifically for our particular situation in, in this climate, in this area, and say, we need to modify this. It's important that you know that we have to make the findings for that modifications, but we can do that, and we do that over, over the period of the last, I know for the sure, the last 10 years we've done that. You got it. Perfect. I'm, I'm glad we had that conversation. Uh, does anybody else on the commission have any questions for staff? I can't see all of you, uh, so you, I will assume that is a no. So I'm going to go back to the applicant and just uh, ask them if they have any rebuttal comments. Uh, you guys have five minutes to address anything you heard in the public comments. 
Yeah, I have a, a couple comments. One, we heard this about mitigating negative debt. And what California over the last few years has done is try to get away from EIRs, particularly for what they call infill projects that are on transportation corridors. I can't think of a more infill and in a transportation corridor project than what we're talking about tonight. This is on uh, Moore Park Road, which is the route of two city bus lines. It's a quarter mile from an on-ramp onto the uh, uh, freeway. And it's a site that's been disturbed for uh, probably a hundred years. So it's not a pristine peripheral site that you need to do an environmental impact report. This is consistent with the direction in California to do mitigated negative decks. The density bonus was already mentioned. We wanted to do a top quality project. We didn't want to ask for any wa waivers that you get into that kind of discussion when you ask for density bonus. We also, there was some discussion about uh, why the property looks the way it does. It looks the way it does because there's no economic return to the owner. In fact, the school district for years said they were purposely not investing in this property because they wanted to relocate the high school. So they had no motivation to uh, change the way the property appeared. I think now we have an opportunity. We have somebody that's willing to work with the historical sites, somebody who's willing to do a top quality project. And if I had a dollar for everybody from New Prairie Park that said, why don't we get some decent proper projects in Newberry Park? Why does Westlake get everything? This is all part of Thousand Oaks. This is the effort to dress up this section of Moore Park Road. And I think this is a, a good project to do it. And with that, uh, unless there are any questions, those are my comments. All right, thank you. Uh, do any of my fellow commissioners have any questions for the applicant, uh, just to follow up? I can see only one of you on the screen. So I will assume that that is a no. So at this point, um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, close the public hearing. And uh, I will open up the floor for uh, a motion and or discussion. Uh, any of my commissioners have anything they'd like to, to lead off with? Chair Buss, I have my hand up. I'm glad to start. Commissioner Lanson, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair Buss. Um, what an interesting process here is to see a very long process that's gone through between city staff and the applicant. And uh, I know a lot of us uh, talk about losing local control a lot. And one of the things that we lose by having that loss of local control is exactly what happened here, in my opinion, based upon a very long discussion and negotiation process uh, between lots of different parties from the applicant and a lot of different people in city staff, which is exactly, in my opinion, is what made this process hopefully as strong as it can be. Um, the difficulty is when we have a state process that mandates things and whether it's objective standards or whether it's anything else, we end up losing that ability to have this back and forth. Uh, you know, could we have gotten a deed restriction without with, with just state mandates? Who knows? So a lot of things end up happening along the lines of what we were just talking about. Um, there's a lot of things coming down from Sacramento uh, that limit our ability to actually have an involvement. Uh, and when, whether it's um, cell phone towers or whether it's this issue, we're pretty much limited sometimes in what we can look at. And right now, I'm not, a, and again, I, I appreciate so many of the comments from people wanting to find ways to improve for electric and for various other environmental issues. And if we had laws in our city, our county, our state that we can actually point to as an executive body, I, I would have no problem pointing to those and trying to make sure they're enforceable. The difficulty is we don't have that. And again, we're not a legislative body. Uh, the Planning Commission can't make a new law. Our discretion is limited to the extent of the laws that we have and the the specific discretion we've been allotted by the city council. Uh, I'm not aware of city council passing a law necessarily to do, kind of do this thing. And again, I, I would love to kind of consider that, but uh, right now I think we're pretty limited to what we have before us. We can sit there and say all the things we'd like it to have, but the reality is in my opinion, looking at the way this project uh, has been put together, all the different pieces, looking at the way the property is and realizing, and again, I go back to my different types of economy. Our economies change. We don't have a goods economy or a service economy. We have an experience-based economy. And having units near shopping and without need for cars is really a great concept at this point. Um, and again, I balance that. There's lots of good and bad, obviously, in terms of, uh, I think somebody pointed out the traffic issues. That's going to be an issue for sure. Uh, the reality is they gave up a lot of density bonus units and fair market value that they could have gotten. And, and, also, and, and by the way, a lot of height issues and other things in terms of development. 
So there's a lot of back and forth that went through this process by virtue of the applicant and the city staff. And I just want to say thank you to all of those parties for the extensive discussions that I absolutely know took place just by virtue of all of the discussion and all the documents that we've had to go through. Um, there are some you know, things that have concerns in terms of the trees. I, I don't like to lose those trees. Uh, I know it sounds like they're in different areas and different problematic issues. And, uh, and again, we're going to replace them, but it's going to take a very long time uh, for those to come back. And it's, it's, it's not easy to actually go through and approve anything where there's going to be the loss of that type of important resource that we have in the city. Uh, and I do that as part of usually looking at a balance in terms of what are we getting? And what we're getting is 218 units with 26 affordable units that provides not just workforce housing, but in my opinion, seniors that want to downsize, uh, kids looking to be there and their parents. I mean, the average sale price of a house in Thousand Oaks right now is $950,000. And that's ridiculous. That's almost impossible to have our kids actually live and work in this process. So again, there's a lot of concerns I would wish it to have in terms of this uh, environmental issues, in terms of trying to find ways to accommodate more affordable housing. I know. Uh, Commissioner Newman pointed out the, uh, the the ordinance that we need to update as well. Uh, but again, I think this this project and the way it's been presented presents the best possible balance of all of those issues going forward uh, to the point that I'm going to go ahead and make the motion to approve. Uh, I, I, do I have to say all this stuff, Mr. Heher, or can I just say I make the motion subject to your condition change? Yeah, I would say the motion would be uh, staff's recommendation as outlined in the staff report. I would move to approve the staff's recommendation as outlined in the report subject to the modification of the one condition. Excellent way to trim that down, sir. <laughs> uh, do any, uh, uh, Vice Chair Newman, I see you're, you're unmuted, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanna concur with uh, Commissioner Lanson's statements, eloquent and on point as usual. Um, and also, Mr. Chair, I want to concur with a point um, that you made for me better than I could myself about the public-private split. Um, I, I really appreciate all the work staff did and the applicant team and all the people who uh, took part in tonight's hearing. I frankly was expecting a much more contentious hearing than the one we had. And I thought there was a lot of uh, agreement here on the need for this project to move forward. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute, but first to follow up on a point that Chair Buss made about the expectation that markets will solve every problem in every case. And that, that it hasn't always been true. It generally is, is very true, but not always. The one line in the staff report I want to take exception with has to do with the preservation of timber school. And it says successful preservation of these historic buildings requires some viable, productive, economic, private use. And that's a bit of editorializing. It's, it's a statement of opinion masquerading as a statement of fact. Um, in fact, this, this building and many landmark regulations all over the place uh, restrict private use or even eliminate it altogether um, for, because of the cultural importance of those sites. And I'm very glad to see, among many other benefits, this project will deliver. It will allow community cultural use. And I want to commend Mr. Maple for the, the photos he submitted today. Those are fascinating insights into our past. And, and now I'll come back to the public comments. All, almost all the public comments were along the nature of, in general, I like what the project is, is offering here, except for this one thing or two things or three things. And I'm with you on both of those set sentiments. I'm, I'm 80, 90% in favor of this. Um, I wish it had mandatory solar on day one. Sounds like to get a building permit, it, it will have that. Um, I wish there was more done with gray water, um, with electric. Um, those are not parts of the code. That's not something we as commissioners have the power to require at this point. But I take Dr. Connolly's point that the building, or I, I, either Dr. Connolly or Ms. Witt, I'm not sure which one of them said this, but the building may require retrofitting by the time of completion if it doesn't have this 
forward thinking approach, even if it's not required, it's the right thing to do. And for that, for all those reasons, I will support this project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Newman. Uh, Commissioner McMahon. Yes, um, I, I do want to uh, follow my fellow commissioners. I agree with everything they've said. Um, no project is going to make me 100% happy or anybody 100% happy. Sounds like the long negotiations between all the parties involved have brought it as close it ca as it can be. I'm excited that we have more housing coming. Uh, and I'm glad that they didn't go for the density bonus because then they would be trying to raise it higher or, or crowd it more and have less of the Paseos. So in, uh, in a good sense, we've won a little bit here. Um, and, and it is a corner that really needs work. So um, I am going to support the motion and I think we've done pretty well with it. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's enthusiasm for this one. Um, I do appreciate all of the work that's gone into it, um, both from staff and from the developer. Um, I, like one of the public speakers, do take exception to the property being called blighted. Less than a decade uh, ago, I was giving seminars to students in those classrooms that no longer exist on that property. Uh, about how to handle life skills and how to do things like pay your rent when you become a grown-up. Um, be aware that some of your future tenants may be among those people I spoke to, and uh, be aware that um, that uh, you you can't hurt people's feelings by 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 uh, denigrating the the history of that property. Um, the other thing I do want to say is. Um, we don't get to decide what projects come in front of us. I think I've a uh, long time told everyone that I'm a, an, addic an advocate for people being, uh, having an ownership stake in the properties they live in, especially when we're talking about affordable housing. Um, I, I see rental properties as a way of uh, continuing uh, to, to uh, increase the gap between uh, the haves and the have-nots to some degree because rents just keep going up, prices keep going up, and unless you do have a portion of the property, you don't have equity in, uh, in, in, in your own future. And so um, I don't see this as a project that, uh, that I can change that on. Uh, what I do see is, is a project that will give us 216 units in the city uh, that people can live in. I see a hotel coming up that um, will benefit the uh, biotech corridor that uh, is taking shape across the freeway. Um, I'm excited for those things. I'm excited for the fact that um, this will be the newest um, building in town that will have the uh, highest standards of environmental um, uh, forward thinking that uh, Sacramento has come up with so far. Um, so uh, like everybody, um, perfect is the enemy of good, and I do believe this is a good project. And so with that, I would uh, like the Secretary to Paris for a vote. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Chair Buss? Aye. Motion, motion carries 4 0. Commissioner Link absent. <clears throat> uh, no, there is no appeal period on the recommendation by a planning commission to the council, so uh, we do not need to cite the appeal process for this decision. Uh, thank you very much for your time, everyone. And uh, we'll be moving on to uh, 7B. Will the clerk please open the public <laughs> hearing? Hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 7B, Municipal Code Amendment MCA 2020 70250 to amend the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code Chapter 4 of, Ch of Title 9 by adding objective design standards for residential development in response to state housing legislation requiring streamlined approval for qualifying residential projects and application of objective design standards as part of the planning review process. Located citywide, the applicant is City of Thousand Oaks. Thank you very much, Secretary Gore. Uh, presenting on behalf of staff is Senior Planner Ian Holt. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair Buss, Commissioners. Uh, can you see my screen all right? 
Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Great. Um, so just as uh, uh, Lori just said, uh, before you have the MCA for the objective design standards. Um, and this is basically it's in response to uh, state housing legislation, uh, such as SB 35 and SB 330, requiring streamlined approval and also the application of objective design standards as part of the approval for decision-making process. Just to provide a quick overview of the amendment, um, we're establishing uh, objective standards to be applicable to a variety of residential and mixed use projects of two or more units. Um, and it would basically, it would capture those duplexes units that were um, also allowed recently under SB 9 uh, under state law, but would not apply to accessory dwelling units as they already have their own objective standards in our municipal code. Um, also, uh, we have uh, set new maximum building heights for R3 and RPD zones, which I'll elaborate on further, as well as revising a building height definition that has a, a clearer method for uh, measurement. So uh, we're here before you based on a municipal code requirement requiring planning commission's review and recommendation of any MCA to the city council. Of course, they have the final action. So as just a, a bit of background, um, you know, SB 35 uh, provided a streamlined ministerial process for projects um, and for units of both um, <clears throat> for projects subject to objective zoning standards as well as um, design review standards. SB 330 uh, amended the Housing Accountability Act and the Permit Streamlining Act. So it created a streamlined housing approval process and then also uh, placed restriction on a jurisdiction on its ability to deny housing based on subjective discretionary standards. And then back in June of this uh, 2020, uh, the City Council initiated the uh, MCA for a variety of regulation and standards that warrant review and evaluation, of which includes the objective design standards. So, you know, what is an objective standard? Basically, it's a re regulation that doesn't need any, involve any judgment, but relies on a quantifiable measure to determine compliance. So the, uh, you know, Terms such as shall and must are typically associated with objective standards. However, you also need to accompany that with some sort of measurable component. But guidelines or recommendations use language such as should or may. So to start off, excuse me, um, you know, staff did an evaluation of the existing design guidelines. And Though these um, design lines are adopted pursuant to the municipal code, and that would imply objectivity, the majority are written are in a subjective manner and are primarily guidance that allows some interpretation and discretion of how the project design meets those guidelines. Um, you know, the, some of the language that we have in a lot of our design guidelines refer to should and can have considerations and also return to, you know, use terms such as compatible in the neighborhood character. So, yeah, but however, you know, the challenge was is in looking at all these design guidelines, converting all of them did not suit the purpose for addressing um, the more of the immediate need of addressing the recent legislation of getting some adoptive, uh, adopted objective standards so that we can apply to residential development. Um, plus, uh, you know, those guidelines without any kind of numeric standards um, would require quite a bit uh, more in-depth analysis and also vetting through the public process. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, in staff's in addition to evaluating the design guidelines, we also found that the existing codes leaves the ability for subjective determinations during the decision making. Uh, there's language in the code, such as the commission, the commission may impose such additional conditions and requirements upon residential development permit as the commission finds are reasonable and necessary to carry out the purposes and requirements of the zone. 
though this language allows um, you know, some flexibility in the past and so forth, language such as this in terms of recent legislation kind of leaves the, the city vulnerable to potential challenges. Um, also in looking at the regulations, they for the most part really focus on single family and townhome development. There was a kind of a lack of um, other multifamily standards. Um, and so we looked to uh, incorporate that into the objective standards. Um, however, you know, we, we did not go into all the individual zones. Uh, we basically looked at what parameters can we apply to residential development. And essentially we will look towards doing a complete municipal code update that will align with the general plan um, further <clears throat> in the future. So the overall intent of the objective standards is basically to strategically position the city to address the residential projects in light of the state law. Uh, it's we're going to establish a basic minimum requirements that facilitate good design while preventing characteristics commonly resulted in poor design. The introduction of the design hierarchy of standards will be critical in creating residential projects that provide interaction with the public realm and buildings designed and scale to promote walkable neighborhoods. Uh, in, in our evaluation of the standards that are presented before you and proposed, staff looked at a variety of jurisdictions that had recently adopted objective standards since they were also reliant on a lot of design guidelines. But coupled with that, we did look at a lot of other cities as far as how they approached specific standards as well. And we basically looked at those and calibrated as we felt was reasonable to reflect the desired character of Thousand Oaks. So the proposed objective standards, um, you know, we have basically seven topic areas that are covered within the standards. You have the overall intent and purpose, um, and then the applicability, which we talked about, or I mentioned earlier, it's applied to residential and mixed use projects of new construction for two or more units. Uh, in the event there's any potential conflict, it would supersede other provisions of Title IX. Um, and then there's also process, which I'll go into further, but it basically defines the review authority. Also, there's findings for approval specifically for objective projects subject to um, objective standards, as well as specific findings for any modifications to the objective standards. Uh, there are a variety of uh, terms are also introduced in the objective standards and are defined within the article. And then you have the bulk of what the standards are and you have the variety of um, categories of which residential projects will need to comply. Um, in terms of the relationship to other ordinances, uh, you know, the projects will still need to meet the variety of the parking, uh, the protected tree ordinance setbacks and a lot of the other standards that are contained within municipal code. So just to kind of touch on the categories, um, starting with the design hierarchy, hierarchy of you know, how does the project interact with the just adjacent existing and proposed streets, and then moving down to site development standards. That's how we divide a site into building areas so that we don't end up with large monolithic buildings. Also, you have the building orientation and unit entries, how they interface with the public realm, how those buildings either face public streets or areas accessible to the public. Also, in terms of parking location configuration, hiding the parking as much as possible from the public frontage. And then you get into the building and associated frontage types, as well as a lot of other um, standards in terms of building massing, articulation, uh, the per percentage of fenestration or window details, and then uh, common open space facilities as far as large for larger multifamily developments, as well as some of the other kind of elements uh, such as accessory structures and other building elements. So first of all, I'll just kind of touch on uh, some of the high points of each of these criterion. Um, you know, in terms of street and pedestrian connectivity, 
Uh, we're looking at, oops, uh, internal connectivity within the project. So generally you're looking to get streets to have a consistent flow and connection uh, with limitations on cul-de-sacs and dead end streets. Also in the event that the project is uh, developed next to uh, streets that tie into the site, uh, the project would be required to tie into that to complete a road network. Also, there is a prohibition on gates on new public or private streets. Um, and that is just for public and private streets. It wouldn't include particularly like driveways or um, you know, the opportunity for paseos. But also any new streets that are introduced as part of projects, um, which it would be required as on sites of greater than two acres, they would be required to be developed like full public streets with parkways and sidewalks. So you can enable uh, street trees and parking as well as pedestrian connections. And then you get into the site development standards and the exhibit there to the left kind of shows you uh, kind of a mock-up of what a potential site, how it can be divided so that the individual building types are designed to provide their own open space have access or frontage onto the public streets. So in terms of the criterion, there is um, uh, a threshold. If a site's over 30,000 square feet, it wouldn't have to be divided into kind of two nominal lots. It's basically dividing the site into two building areas to comply with the placement of a building on each of those lots. Uh, when you get it into something larger, uh, then you get into a minimum of three buildings. Um, then you move on to the building orientation. Basically, uh, the main entry will be oriented towards the street or in courtyard developments uh, where develop, um, units are facing courtyards and so forth. Those entries, yeah, um, I'm sorry, entries would be required to face the interior courtyards or walkways or paseos so that they're all connected with a direct path of travel from the public street. Um, also, there is requirements for the entry areas to be recessed and covered, as well as introduction of balconies uh, along street frontages and courtyards. Uh, that basically 25% of the residential units facing the street or any of those courtyards would require to have a balcony overlooking that space. And again, this is about creating those, the eyes on the street and activating the building to those spaces. Another important one is uh, parking location. And the premise behind this is really trying to hide the parking behind the building frontage, either on the side or the rear. Also, um, you know, very uh, similar to the conversation earlier on the project before you, subterranean parking configurations uh, would limit the height above grade to be three feet above. So that would be a limitation on the maximum podi podium height. Also, um, in the event that uh, a parking structure is proposed, it could only be used when it's providing public parking or it is provided shared parking between uh, a variety of uses. So non-residential and residential uses so that basically there is some economies of scale. Also, uh, in terms of surface parking, there would be a limited limits on how parking is visible from the street. So it, there are limits on how wide the project frontage can expose parking. And then you have an exhibit here of some uh, Los Feliz apartments, essentially, where, yeah, they have basically hidden the parking behind the building. <clears throat> And then we get into the building types and design. And, you know, we'll have, uh, there's the front yard house, duplex, triplex, villa, bungalow courts, townhouse, side court, courtyard housing, stack dwelling, mixed use. I won't go through each of those building types, but I do have slides if, you know, any of those want to be discussed later. Um, we have a couple examples of uh, walk-up uh, courtyard apartments as well as uh, multiplex units. But the primary components of all of these is that uh, you know, you have unit access, again, directly from the street, a paseo, or a courtyard. 
that is a basically an extension of uh, an access extension from the public street or private street. Um, and then there's also provisions on how open space is configured. And that is basically, that's based on what type of building type there is. And then also when you're incorporating parking facilities into the building, how that parking is configured in relation to the building frontage. One thing I'd like to touch upon with the building types and design, um, you know, as I mentioned in our evaluation of the municipal code, I mean, a lot of the um, provisions in the municipal code are um, slanted towards uh, single family homes, as well as townhomes, which are actually represented here in the missing middle housing configuration. But there wasn't a whole lot of um, criterion for some of the other um, building types that we're introducing that fill that missing middle, which are, you know, they basically provide a transition from the existing family, single family neighborhoods towards the urban centers. So it's a way of getting multifamily uh, in a similar scale to single family homes. And uh, so. Then um, there are, you know, each building, uh, depending on where, how it's configured, um, you know, we'll have to provide one of the applicable uh, frontage types. There will be dimensional criteria associated with them as far as, you know, porch depth, maximum height, and so forth. But primarily, um, you know, these are the requirements on how the entries of the buildings are designed. Another big one is um, building massing and articulation. Uh, we've there's limits on the maximum building length, not to exceed 200 feet. Um, and there's also requirements for you know, building bases. You know, whenever you're you have a, a dis distinguishing the first floor from the upper stores stories, uh, the main entrance must be easily identifiable and distinguished from other entrances. And then there's uh, plane breaks or basically articulation requirements on the exterior building walls. Things such as uh, offsets of one foot for every 30 feet, uh, three-story buildings much, must have a major massing break of 30 inches deep by four feet wide every 100 feet along the street in public areas, and other minor massing breaks of 12 inches by four feet for areas a little less than 30 feet in length. Then there's also a criterion for a variety of uh, height and roof forms, and also uh, for criteria as far as how many materials um, and how they must appear on those facades. One thing I would like to note, um, as I mentioned, parking structures, and we'll probably see few examples of those moving forward, but in the event that we do, this building amassing and articulation criteria would also apply to any kind of freestanding parking structure. Uh, facade transparency and limitation on blank walls. Again, this is really just speaking to um, creating a, a minimum percentage of windows and openings on a facade. Um, and then the only exception would be the Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan or any other specific plan that creates a criterion, but um, it's 50% just to note in the Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan. One of the other things is uh, window details, um, basically touching on how divided lights and millions should apply. Um, also that window recesses on windows, and then if there are shutters to be used, if they're proportionate in size. And then as we get into the larger scale projects, um, projects of over a hundred units would be required to at least have three types of open spaces. Um, that function for general use, teenagers and younger children. And then you have, you know, projects of just 25 units or more require at least one children's play area. And then there's of course an exemption for age restricted developments of which at that point, um, they would just need to provide the open space criteria um, that's required under the building type. 
So moving away from the new Article 22 objective standards um, in reviewing the municipal, municipal code, um, there was a couple of um, criterion that we looked at that really were open-ended in terms of how uh, they could be applied. Uh, one was the maximum height for R3 and RPD. Uh, you know, it starts off by saying that's a 25 foot maximum. However, you can increase the height as long as you keep increasing the setback. However, it does not set forth any kind of ultimate or maximum height overall. So uh, essentially, as you read it, the height is, um, could go fairly high as long as you keep increasing the side, the side yard setback. Um, also, there's language in there that the decision-making body essentially can modify the standards uh, when you're trying to address lower income households for the housing element. So staff evaluated that and proposes a new language. And, you know, staff in looking at, um, you know, wanted to start off with a quantifiable maximum height measurement that allows heights that are both commensurate with the heights of anticipated multifamily development and also consistent for the most part with existing development. So we started with a maximum height of 35 feet. Um, there is an incentive here uh, for affordable housing of which if you are providing 20% or more affordable housing units, which by the way is a lot um, uh, in comparison to what you would be afforded under a density bonus law, um, you could go up to 45 feet. But with the exception of that, that taller portion over 35 feet does not cover more than 40% of the building footprint. So the other thing that staff looked at um, is the existing definition for building height. And this is what's how it reads, you know, it says the mean, it means the vertical distance from the grade to the highest point of the coping of a flat roof or to the deck line of a mansard roof or to the average height of the highest gable of a pitch or hip roof. So I, I think there's there's been a bit of discussion with staff internally about the application of this. And over the years, it has left room for interpretation by both staff and decision makers. Um, so, you know, implementation of this definition often results in an interpretation and, you know, possible non-uniform application of the standard. With such, um, staff basically proposes a new definition. And this is essentially uh, a vertical dimension that's measured from existing or the finished grade, whichever is less or more restrictive to a warp plane uh, that basically matches the topography of the underlying site. Um, and this is basically in order to provide greater clarity and a more consistent method of measuring height as proposed. So before you, I just have, um, you know, a couple examples. These are in your staff report. And it shows a couple of situations where the proposed methodology uses the more restrictive of the measurements of either the existing or finished grade. Uh, in the top case where it is a cut example um, is the <clears throat> proposed grade or finished grade is the more restrictive. However, um, you know, looking to the fill site, then the existing grade then is the more restrictive. And then if you have a site that does the combination of two, then you would have, again, a warp plane that would match the most restrictive portion of the finished grade and the more restrictive portion of the existing grade. And I mean, this is just for a simple uh, demonstration. I mean, this would be measured from front to back, side to side. It would basically cover all cross sections of the site. So it's not taken at one static point. So the intent behind that is to basically match the building form with the topography of the land. 
As far as uh, the objective standards, um, it clarifies the, the review process. It would require a residential plan development permit uh, unless it is an application being sought ministerially under SB 35. Um, if a project is coming in and only requires a residential plan development permit and meets all the objective standards, the community development director has the approval authority. Um, but in the event that you have other entitlements such as a tentative track map, of course, then that would have to go to the city council or the, the planning commission or any other entitlements requiring planning commission or eventually city council review. Um, also, there are specific findings that we have made for the objective standards um, as uh, just to basically remove all subjectivity. Also, we've introduced um, uh, modification findings as well. So these would be the, mod the findings necessary to make a modification to the objective standards. They would be the same by both either the planning commission or the city uh, community development director. And um, I can explain which standards they apply. The community development director can approve up to three modifications on some of the criterion of objective standards, whereas the more pivotal or crucial site design and building form ones would require, um, if there's just one modification, that would require a planning commission review. So just real briefly, uh, you know, this municipal code amendment, it's consistent with the general plan goal of just developing appropriate tools to enable development in an efficient and compatible manner. Um, also the general plan policy to strive to provide a balanced range of adequate housing uh, by introducing some missing middle housing types. Also it's consistent with uh, city council top 10 priorities as far as addressing housing needs as well as the city council um, goal of implementing high quality revitalization projects and support long-term affordable housing. Uh, and just quickly, uh, under CEQA, uh, this is the Missile Code Amendment is essentially uh, exempt um, because it doesn't represent a project that has any kind of potential for causing a significant effect on the environment. It is essentially adoption of new code requirements that enhance um, you know, the aesthetic development of the Thousand Oaks. Ultimately, any projects that are being built under these objective standards would undergo their own separate environmental review process. So with that, staff recommends the city council find that the municipal code amendment is exempt from CEQA and also recommend approval to the amendments of chapter four, title nine of Thousand Oaks municipal code as described in attachment two. And that would conclude my presentation and I'm available for questions. Mr. Holt, I just want to lead off by saying uh, thank you so much for that presentation. A lot of that reading was very dry for me and uh, <laughs> you've made it much more accessible. So thank you. <laughs> um, well, and yeah, I have a lot of backup information too. So as we get into the, um, you know, the, the Q and A, we can dive a little deeper as much as you want. Perfect. Uh, if you can end screen sharing just so I can see my call. Of course. Commissioners. Thank you. All right. I would like to go ahead and hand it over to my commissioners if you have any questions. Uh, Vice Chair Newman, you have your hand up first. Hit the button first. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Holt, for your presentation. I, too, found it very informative. The uh, memo that we received was dated January 25th of this year. And my question is about the timing of this hearing. Uh, why did staff schedule this hearing now, um, especially two weeks before another large application where subjective criteria may come into play? Why? Oh, well, I mean, why is it before you now and not we earlier? We have this memo from January. Why, why are we doing this now? Um, especially vis-a-vis -vis a hearing we'll be having. Well, it, essentially it was, it, what we were prompted to bring it forward back in January, actually. Um, and it was um, pulled 
um, for a variety of workload reasons, I believe. Yeah, um, I can, it, it, yeah. And I can help with that. Um, yeah, and that's exactly it. There, there was just a tremendous amount of workload and um, we had to prioritize different things. And we had, as you know, the general plan going full steam for the land use map and that consumed a big majority of our time. Um, so we had to just prioritize our workload and that's a simple answer. Um, and if I, Mr. If, Parker, yeah, wants to add to that. Yeah, and if I may add, um, the standards that you're reviewing tonight will not be in effect by the time you review the next project. So it wouldn't have any bearing on the review of that as well. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, um, and actually, actually, if I may, Mr. Newman, I mean, and um, you know, yes, I mean, that's that's definitely correct. And I think, you know, there are a variety of pre-screens out there. And even if some have not reached their approval stage, um, you know, those that have a specific plan, you know, they have the opportunity to create their own standards. I mean, much like the project that was before you earlier, there was a development agreement and so forth. So, you know, a lot of those things are negotiated. What right. we're trying to, you know, this is all set up so that, um, you know, when the new general plan, primarily when the new general plan is adopted and more of these developments are essentially allowed, not necessarily by right, but there's a lot limited ability or local control or flexibility that we have something in place so that, um, you know, kind of these fundamental designs are addressed up front. So oh, I will also say that a lot of the projects that we have right now are going to be controlled by the DA, right? The development agreement, and that's going to impact um, the negotiation, some of the aspects of the project itself. As uh, Mr. Holt noted, with SB 35, SB 330, SB 9, they're all starting to require these objective standards. And as we go into the future, the concern is we want to make sure that we're ready for those particular cases that come up in front of us that are pretty clear cut. It's in a residential spot. If you have, I mean, for all these things, by the way, it's, it, we have it, you know, in this last case, we, for example, we had a GPA, we had a general plan amendment to do, right? So it's, it's the cases in which it is already residential. Those are the ones that are going to be uh, getting hit with this objective standard thing that we have to have mandated by the state. Okay. Well, while I have you, Mr. Heher, is the is the city through the League of California Cities or, or anyone else uh, challenging the legality of any of these state-imposed mandates? Well, I would say uh, we certainly have done our part to try to oppose many of the housing um, laws that have been coming into play. I, I will say that, uh, you know, frankly, I think the state is moving in a direction that's very difficult for a lot of cities. You will note, I think it's in the staff report, in fact, that um, at the sunset time for SB 330 or the Housing Crisis Act has been uh, kicked out from 2025 to 2030. Uh, so you have those kind of things. I think the objective standards, though, are, are something that's got to stay. I think there's a good purpose for it. And one of those things is that it kind of helps clarify, not just for the applicant who's coming in, like, what are the rules that we have to go by for these basic projects, but also for staff so we don't have, for example, the interpretation of... Hey, no, no, I understand the benefit um, proposed here. Uh, my, my question is whether there's any legal action challenging any of the state mandates that are mentioned in the staff report? Well, this, certainly the city has not is not involved in any, uh, okay. other, you know, being a member of the League of California Cities, if they're okay. doing anything, that would be where right. at the stage. And then, and then about scoping of this, um, Mr. Holt, you mentioned that this is scoped to residential projects or mixed use, residential, commercial. Are subjective guidelines still permitted in the assessment of commercial projects? Yes, yes, they are. I mean, I think, you know, as far as all the legislation, it's been focused on housing. And, you know, so, because, uh, and, and yeah, quite a bit of our, <clears throat> quite a bit of our guidelines are associated with, yeah, commercial. Okay, so if someone comes in and says, I want to put up an 80-story building and paint it hot pink, I can say that's a hideous idea and, and the state isn't going to come arrest me or anything. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the, some of the ideas, and I, I want to concur with the comments Mr. Heer made, um, I didn't see anything in the report about 
accessibility. And I wonder if there's an opportunity here, if we're going to adopt objective standards, uh, to go beyond ADA and adopt something, I don't know, like universal design guidelines or something that would codify how residential projects are made accessible to everyone. Well, the, the focus was primarily a zoning focus. So, mm -hmm. you know, those again are more building code related and I would think, and definitely would require more, you know, uh, a building slant and evaluation of those, you know, what percentage. And I, I think there would need to be some sort of feasibility analysis. It's like, well, you know, what proportion of a project can you make that and, you know, not be too onerous. So I think there's a lot of things to consider. So we, our main focus was just zoning. Okay. I'll come back to zoning in a moment. Um, there's a reference. Say, Commissioner Newman, it really, really quick, just when you talk about ADA, we're talking about federal law. So just that. Right, right. My, my, my question is more about, if, if this is a, the proposal before us is not about federal law. It's about design guidelines. Right. And, I'm, I'm very familiar with ADA, a okay. family member of mine wrote large portions of it, but okay. a lot of that covers things like the shape of doorknobs and, and what color dots there have to be, what, what the Pantone color is for dots at a crosswalk and things like that. And, and I'm asking a more high level question about architectural guidelines, universal design when it comes to accessibility and whether there's an opportunity to incorporate that here. I guess my point is just that I want to make sure that we're, if we do that a type of analysis, we have to make sure we're incorporating the federal aspect of it. So we're not being, you know, we, we don't do something that's already preempted by federal law. That That's where I would fall with it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, there's a reference in, uh, this is page two of the staff report, um, saying there could be ministerial approval for projects um, where there's 50% affordable housing. That that number struck me. I mean, question is, has, has there ever been a project like that in Thousand Oaks? With no, no. So, and, and that percentage is specific to, well, certain jurisdictions in Thousand Oaks is one of them. And so the likelihood of that actually occurring is very slim. Um, the project would have to have prevailing wage. There's a, a whole myriad of other criterion. So, in order for them to get that ministerial process, so. Okay. I could use clarification on something on page seven of the report. Um, this is point four of your report. You go through process and mm -hmm. you, you define, um, th these, are, these are basically tests where modifications would be permitted. And you, and you give three of them. Um, so 4B mm -hmm. says a modification would, if, if it would result in development consistent with scale and character of existing allowable development in the vicinity. And I, I get that. Um, my question is, how is that different than the previous example you gave of of bad subject, subjective design where use of language such as compatible with neighborhood character or shall be in harmony with. I mean, I mean so yeah, there, it, it's very nuanced. Yes. It doesn't sound like the same thing to me. Well, I think the key, the key, there's a couple things to look at there specifically. It's the scale and character of existing and allowable development. So not just what's there today on the ground, but what does the zoning allow? So in, and a in a development in the vicinity under the same zoning. Okay, so and allowable is the difference? And in the same zoning. Okay. So in the event when you have R3 next to R1, you don't get to base your decision on R3 based on uh, the context of R1 criterion. Right, right, okay. Um, I also appreciated your, your examples in your presentation about uh, the new proposed standard for building height. Mm -hmm. um, 
question in that is does the the maximum using that that I, the warp plane I think you called it yeah um, is that an absolute maximum or or does it exempt extensions for things like HVAC or other powers that may it does exempt things that are um, already in the municipal code as allowable you know extensions above the height criteria um, you know in terms of HVAC systems though uh, the other part of the municipal of the objective standards talks about screening of HVAC systems and typically that screening would be an integral part of the roof line so based on the objective standards you typically not going to get an HVAC system popping up above the roof line as an exception to the rule because it's meant to be tucked into the roof form. Um, I'm going to differ with you on that. We, we have previously approved projects where um, HVAC has exceeded the, the whatever code it says is the maximum. I understand that. So how is this not the maximum then? We, the maximum height is measured to the highest part of the roof line. Okay, so you're, so we're retaining the ability to exempt for things like HVAC. There could be there could be cases where extensions to a building would exceed that maximum. Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes, if I if I can just provide a, a bit of background there, the well, code does allow the maximum height to be exceeded for appurtenances such as elevator shafts, sometimes equipment with appropriate screening and other uh, appropriate rooftop equipment. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's what you're referring to in this instance. That's exactly what I'm thinking of. So and we have had past cases where that's come up. That yeah, is correct. I understand, yes. So what I wanted to clarify, and this is on page 20 at the top of the staff report, Mm -hmm. Rooftop equipment must be screened by the roof structure or by equipment screening from. So, you know, in some instances, it's going to be, I mean, the intent is to tuck it into the building form and not have roof mounted screening project above the main roof line. That still can occur. So, all right. I, well, that's where that, that doesn't reference the height. The, the, point, the point here, and I think we're in agreement on this, you're saying is when we refer to building height, that's one level, and there may be extensions like elevator, exactly, shaft, HVACs or whatever that go beyond that. Those provisions of the code remain. Okay, thanks. That that's what I was getting at. Um, the final thing I'll say is not a question; it's really an assertion. Um, but as you stated in your presentation, the height limit in the municipal code today for R3, for RPD, is 25 feet. That's current city law. Um, the city council endorsed the GPU and endorsed looking at future revisions to that. But I want to be clear, if we vote to approve this, are we approving a change in zoning that would allow, or not, not in zoning, Per se, but in, in these two zones, are we are we increasing the maximum height from 25 to 35 feet in R3 and RPD zones? Because that's what I read this as as endorsing. Well, um, the maximum height starts off with stating what you just stated that 25 feet is the maximum. However, Every the maximum the height may be increased. Up. Right, right, right. And there's, no, and there's no set maximum at that point. So 25 feet is kind of the starting point, but it can go higher. And there is no, no maximum limit set. So the fact that this allowance, this allows something to go essentially higher than 35 feet, staff felt based on uh, the intent of a R3 zone being a multifamily zone and, you know, our RPD, you know, for the most part, any new RPDs are going to be in the more than likely the higher density category. Um, 35 feet was commensurate to 
you know, the building types that you would get in those zones. Right. We are, uh, but my question essentially is we are, if we approve this, are we slipping in a height increase of 10 feet? From, I would say no. From the baseline. The baseline is currently 25 feet in the city code. I understand it can be extended, but, but currently the maximum is stated as 25 feet. I understand that, but I... Th can I um, add something here? Please. Um, so it says 25 feet and it can go up, but this says it cannot exceed 35 feet. So it's, it's establishing a maximum cap. And, and when we discuss this among, among um, ourselves as commissioners, I think we should have the discussion about floors and ceilings. I just wanna be clear that, that I understand correctly what's being proposed here. And what you're saying is the change, if we approve it, would change a maximum height, number one. And number two, that, that it would set a ceiling without extensions of 35 feet in these two zones. Um, and I would, I would add that I think it establishes a height cap that is not there currently. Because we're, the fact yes. that we're having this discussion is because it's confusing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're trying to, to establish some certainty in that and make it objective and say that's not I mean, exist. Yeah, we could end up with 45 foot buildings if yeah. they meet that setback under this rule. Right, right, under the current rule, you're saying? Yes. Yeah, 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 no, I understand it can be extended. I'm just, I'm looking at the letter of the law and it's saying maximum 25, except if you do this, 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 this. And, and, and I'm not gonna start going through all the areas of the code that have conflicting language like this, but this is one that we felt was very pertinent in terms of getting an objective standard right, I just want to be in sure terms of that maximum. We're clear on what we're changing here. And with that, I, I thank you again for your presentation and yeah. turn it back to Chair Buss. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Newman. Uh, Commissioner Lanson, I see your hand up. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Buss. And thank you, Mr. Holt, for going through the report. And again, I did love your reading style as well. It kept us uh, informed and involved in the process. Um, quick question in terms of uh, how does this impact the city's current pre-screening process in any way? Not the pre-screening process because, I mean, really the pre-screening process doesn't really have an evaluation of the site plan for the most part or building plans. I mean, staff does not make a recommendation under the pre-screening process. So it's, I mean, the applications are fairly simplistic. I mean, some applicants may provide more detail than others and so forth. Um, but no, this would not necessarily, as staff doesn't even provide a recommendation pre-screen, so we wouldn't even be evaluating a project against those. So um, yeah, and you're right. It's, it's difficult because the process has changed where we used to get actually very detailed architectural plans. And now I'm assuming at this point, most of the time we don't. So this, this would not impact that pre-screening process at all? Correct. Okay, um, kind of a little bit of what uh, Mr. Newman was going through in terms of the objectivity. You mm -hmm. commented that uh, one of the provisions would allow um, uh, the development department to, uh, I guess, approve th to three modifications. I'm trying to make sure, is, is the number three objective? <laughs> Where do we get that from, by the way? Well, sure, it's numeric. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's three, so um, that was something that I, I think we just collectively decided upon um, and actually, if, let me, hold on. I do have a slide that kind of identifies because there's certain criteria. So um, that the community development director can do up to three. And, you know, those are actually quite on. I guess and what you're saying is it's objectivity towards the process. Correct. Um, there's still going to be elements that we get to have discretion on that you guys can implement or we as part of this process. Yes, yes, there's still discretion in, you know, evaluating those modifications. So, you know, that basically what happens is, is once you're asking for a modification, um, it kind of 
it opens it up. You're no longer complying with the objective standards. And, and I think, again, kind of going back to what you guys were just talking about, it, it sets instead of the minimum, I think it, it tries to set a maximum, <laughs> which may be, again, maybe a little bit more clear in terms of what you can go up to. Well, now, I actually, so, I mean, these objective standards, they're quite extensive. So, um, you know, the community development director can do up to three, but it's not to say that there can't be more. If there's more of those, you know, the building massing and scale or you know, articulation or the window fenestration or accessory structures, you know, if there's modification of those standards of four or more, then the project would have to go to the planning commission. Okay. So that's, it's the ceiling for which the community development director can approve modifications. Okay. After that yeah. point, they could ask for more. Okay, but then it, but there's a set process by which people have to go through. Then they would uh, go to the planning commission to ask. Uh, my last question, uh, one part of this, there's an indication that uh, depending on, I guess, on how the general plan update works out, uh, these standards may have to be revisited. And I guess I didn't understand why. Well, um, you know, part of it is, is that, you know, we're looking at these with a little bit of a crystal ball. I mean, we know in the discussions of the general plan update, there has been a focus on introducing the missing middle. You know, we've introduced some building types that help address that and so forth. But what that really alludes to is after the general plan update, there's going to be a more comprehensive look at the municipal code. You know, we're going to look at the underlying zoning districts. We're going to have to create new zoning districts, you know, probably two different mixed use zones at least. Um, and we'll probably be looking at the individual zoning districts to see if there's any other kind of updates that would need to be done. And then there's so you're looking still, at we're looking at potentially passing this and have it be in effect before the plan update obviously is approved or voted on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This would basically be in place. Um, yeah, prior to the general plan. And again, just go back to I think what was uh, Mr. Newman's initial question is, is what at what point of projects would they be subject to this new rule then? At what point of that process? Well, um, so uh, if this moves forward onto the city council and they adopt it um, next month, um, then it would be effective in 30 days. So it would basically apply to all residential projects. So, I mean, if you were coming into any of the residential zones, R3 or RPD, and wanting to do, and you submit your development application, we would be evaluating that project against but, it. And that's that's new applications. What about existing ones that are already submitted? Um, they, it would be, if they are submitted and deemed complete, So that, that would pass. They through, would not, not be subject to it, yeah. Okay, all right, so that would be a definitive line that, that hopefully that those applicants would be told that the rules may be changing to the extent that mm -hmm. process kind of is implemented. Correct. Correct. All right, thank you. Nothing further, Chair Buss. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McMahon, did you have any questions? Um, no, I think my fellow commissioners have asked all my questions, thank you. You got them. We're going to go back to uh, Vice Chair Newman. It looks like you have your hand up again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have one quick follow-up question. On yes. the, the the commission previously heard a case uh, involving a renovation of the Cheesecake Factory restaurant at Oaks Mall. And staff's recommend, initial recommendation was to reject the application because of a lack of articulation on the outside elements and mm. insufficient blending with the surrounding architectural elements. And my question is, would that judgment under these new under this new proposal be considered a subjective or an objective judgment? Well, uh, I think, I mean, it's, it, first of all, yes, it would be subjective, but I think your example is a little bit of apples and oranges because that is, I'm assuming, a non-residential project of which... Fair point. Fair point. Is, so, but but to, to answer your question, is that decision that or recommendation was a subjective... Yes, it was a subjective stance because they were relying on the commercial design guidelines. And if you go through those, even though 
the municipal code points to them, the language in that uses, you know, the shoulds, the considerations, mm -hmm. the mays, and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the non-numeric terms. So, um, yeah. Okay, the reason I ask is because the, the element in dispute was articulation or the lack of it. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is one part of the standards that would be permitted under an objective review. So would that be looked at differently under the new regime? Articulation? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it would be codified. It would be code. It would not be a guideline. So, you know, it's a matter of, do they have the mandatory plane break for every 100 foot increment of building? Mm -hmm. If they don't, then they have to ask for a modification. At that okay. point, you would, you know, then there's the findings that would have to be made. Okay, so with this specific example of articulation, you would specify a specific amount of articulation that has to occur, something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, and you know, that's, you know, they're enumerated in that, in the staff report in the uh, ordinance. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. I just I wasn't clear on the the delineation between subjective and objective. So thank you for that, and thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions that are going to seem far less intelligent than my other commissioners. Uh, w something that struck me was the the concept of uh, gated communities. Um, because of uh, gates and fencing no longer being is so is that uh, something that doesn't exist anymore or will not exist in the future uh, in future developments you can't you can't gate a condo complex or something like that because it said pro public and private access ways and it was my understanding so the intent is is that for those projects that introduce have to introduce a public or a private street and in this case it's a you know it's a private street that is walks and talks like a public street exactly. in those instances we are recommending that there are no longer gated entrances now it's not to say that the complex itself the entrance the Paseo entrance into the courtyards, into the condo complex, those can still have gates. A driveway going into a parking garage or a subterranean parking garage can have a gate. But something that is required to be configured as a street would not. Okay. And then the other one was, uh, my understanding is, is uh, some of the legislation that recently passed, and forgive me for not having the SB or AB memorized, but um, there's the capacity to subdivide lots now in uh, single family areas. And part of our thing says no flag lots. So does that mean that um, any subdividing of lots would have to be from the front facing versus front to back? Well, that is a that's a good question, Bus. And you're right. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> you, you, you that, but I do have a good I have an answer for that because you know under SB nine, yes, I mean your your typical single family household. How are you going to subdivide and put that duplex in your backyard like the state law allows you? And the way for you to get access to the back of the lot is through a panhandle. The thing is, is that yes, we can have our subdivision standards and so forth, and um, and in this instance, yes, we're recommending that there are no more flag lots. They have been kind of troublesome, and they've been kind of this band-aid approach to squeezing in units on single-family developments. Again, you know, most of these standards, and you know, a lot of the development we're going to be seeing is less likely to be single-family developments, but. In regards to SB9, the thing is, is that we cannot apply a standard that would preclude the ability for someone to subdivide their lot and meet those state regulations. So someone would have to point to the law and say, well, that one objective standard that you're applying would preclude me from doing what the state law says otherwise I can do. Um, those are my thoughts on that. I did think of that okay. um, when we were looking at SB9. Um, you know, there's there's probably a number of other rules out there, and we have not really jumped in uh, and really evaluated what are the ramifications of SB9 versus even the existing code as it stands today. You know, where what are those standards that we have that would, 
you know, preclude the ability of what someone is allowed under SB9. Gotcha. And so, All right. And then the other example I was thinking of is like in a cul-de-sac. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Wildwood neighborhood. But, yeah. uh, but they have the cul-de-sacs that abut one another, and then there's a uh, pedestrian walkway through them. Mm. So would that be something that would still be something that's acceptable under city, under this new city standards, or would it not be acceptable? Well, generally, the cul-de-sacs would be. Um, let me let me pull up this section here. So, I mean, first, yeah, we come off by saying that new cul-de-sacs and dead-end streets are prohibited. However, unless there's topographical constraints or other existing development prohibit the development of through streets. So in the event that we have a cul-de-sac that's over 300 feet, then yes, you have to have that pedestrian or bicycle path connection in between the two. Okay, so that so would there's, work. there's gotta be some sort of physical constraint precluding you from connecting the street through or something like that. So it, it it comes off reading strong, but there's a little bit of flexibility there. Gotcha. Okay, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you very much on that. Um, let's go ahead and uh, move on to public comments. I believe we have uh, one speaker that would like to speak. Um, they will have five minutes. Uh, if I can ask uh, Dr. Connolly to state your uh, name and city of residence for the records, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, are you hearing me? I'm not seeing myself. Oh, there I, can hear I am. You. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, my new hobby is to point out to city council and to planning commissioners uh, why so many people in our community appreciate the mandates that are coming from the state. And this conversation. Uh, uh, is an example of that. This immediate need to adopt objective standards is coming from the state laws that are uh, the mandates that so many in our city administration seem to object to. Uh, I just want it to be clear that there are many in our community that are celebrating those mandates as the motivation to move toward better government. So I want to read something out of uh, the document prepared by staff after starting with a list of all of the reasons why the state made uh, the city do this, we come down to a section that says currently the existing code with partial exception to the Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan does not address design standards related to fundamental site and building design terms such as building orientation, parking placement, Define building and frontage types, building massing, open space configuration, facade articulation, and windows. During the evaluation of residential and mixed use projects, staff spent a significant amount of time going back and forth with applicants refining the project design through negotiation rather than application of a standard. Establishing clear objective standards benefits both the city and the applicant with certainty and greater efficiency through the planning process. It's the best paragraph in the whole report, and thank you for it, uh, because this is the right way to treat people, developers, and property owners who want to build housing in the city of Thousand Oaks. And by making this process more transparent, less frustrating, this city can have more housing which we need. We need affordable housing and we need just regular old housing in order to maintain the health of the city's economy. So, so 
we, we're cheering the pressure from the outside because the city apparently needs it in order to uh, to make changes like adopting these uh, standards. So uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Commissioner Newman brought up the uh, possibility of universal design uh, being incorporated. And I just wanted to say that the California Department of Housing and Community Development has uh, a published template of a universal design model ordinance for cities. And uh, it it is an excellent primer on the uh, kinds of uh, I'm going to call them mandates, <laughs> the kinds of mandates that a city can put into effect to encourage new building and modified buildings that are usable and accessible by people who become disabled or are disabled. And as one of my friends in the disability community likes to point out, if you live long enough, you are going to be disabled. And uh, many of the standards are appropriate for our fast aging city population. Uh, so um, uh, that's all that I have to say tonight is go mandates. Uh, and thank you for all of your hard work on behalf of the residents of the city of Thousand Oaks. Thank you for your time, Dr. Connolly, and thanks for sticking with us so late this evening. Um, uh, for everyone out there, uh, we have one more speaker. We get a bonus speaker this evening. Uh, so Jackson Piper, you have five minutes and you have the floor. Uh, thank you, I'll try not to take up all the five minutes, but um, I wanna echo what Dr. Connolly said. Um, I think this is a great thing. Um, it will help clarify uh, for property owners and for developers, what's expected of them in the city. And like has been mentioned earlier, um, you know, if they want to want to go further than that, they want to have more um, kind of control over their their development, then they can go before the planning commission, city council, and argue their case. But this at least sets um, some good guidelines and good standards for what we expect to see in the city, and that'll make things um, less frustrating going forward. Um, I like the idea of, of setting the 35 foot height uh, within the R3 and RPD zones and uh, especially like having an allowance of an additional 10 feet for a density bonus. Um, I'm wondering why 40% exactly was the, uh, the decision for what was allowed of that, uh, you know, 40% of the building footprint for that 45 foot height. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something that maybe could be addressed better through a step back um, at that story of the building rather than just saying blanket 40% of the building can be this height and no more. Um, I'm also wondering if the same kind of allowance is going to be given for mixed use and stack developments within the city if they happen to meet the same density bonus requirements. Um, and also, you know, I, this is possibly not the right forum for this, but I'd like to see something similar done for climate mitigating measures, um, basically as a as a you know provide for additional density, additional height as a concession, if certain set climate targets are met within the project. Um, and then one thing I didn't see in the parking um, section of the document was about uh, reduction in parking standards based upon availability of other means of transportation, such as local uh, public transportation, shared vehicle systems, uh, reliable and safe cycling and pedestrian facilities. And also a um, basically a, a measurement of actually how much of the parking that is required is actually used in certain types of projects because uh, parking standards tend to be based on estimates and concerns rather than actual um, hard data. So I would like to see, uh, you know, based on the research of Donald Shoup and Richard Wilson, um, 
some effort to sort of reduce parking requirements that have been uh, over required over development of parking um, because that just wastes space in the city it increases the cost of projects and it it uh, does not benefit the walkability or enjoyability of the city um, and then also there's a street and pedestrian connectivity and automobile access section um, I was wondering also related to that what about the cycle network connectivity and safety, uh, you know, kind of standards of, of safe facilities for those who commute by bicycle specifically. Um, I have to say, you know, Thousand Oaks has some wonderful cycling facilities for recreational cyclists, but I feel like we really have not done well by people who choose cycling as a mode of transportation rather than as a recreational activity. And I, I would like to see us address that. Um, I have one concern about on page four of the document, it says public streets, alleys, and pedestrian pathways within a proposed subdivision or development site must be aligned with existing and planned streets in adjacent neighborhoods to create a continuous street pattern. I'm worried about the word aligned here because I think a lot of people tend to think in terms of um, in terms of right angles in planning and, and you know developing streets. Um, I think there are going to be situations where that's not going to be appropriate. And I think that the word connected uh, in place of aligned would be a good idea. Um, connecting is, is very good to improve the walkability of an area, but I don't think it needs to be a, a rigid grid, basically. Uh, and one final comment um, for pedestrian uh, improvements. I would like to see a requirement for continuous sidewalks on uh, at non-arterial intersections. Um, the American way of doing things is to have pedestrians step into the automobile environment across the street. The Dutch way is to have a continuous sidewalk that doesn't change its elevation. So the pedestrian basically has the right of way and then autos that wish to cross that realm have to go up a ramp and it creates a more inviting environment for pedestrians. And I think we're gonna need that with our aging population here. Uh, that'll be all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Piper, and thanks to the shout out for uh, Holland. I lived there for a few years as a child. All right, at this point, we will go back to Mr. Holt uh, for any uh, rebuttal you have, sir. Um, I don't have necessarily any rebuttal. Um, I mean, we heard the you know comments from uh, Dr. Connolly, you know, uh, regarding state mandates. Uh, again, the universal design ordinances, I did look at that. Um, you know, I think for the most part, it has been looked upon as promoted as more optional as far as what I've seen in other jurisdictions. But again, um, I think it's something that would require further study. And again, we kind of stayed away again from, you know, the building code realm of things. Um, you know, our resources were primarily focused on uh, the zoning criteria as far as residential design. And that being said, uh, you know, based on Jackson's comments on parking standards, um, you know, we did not, uh, you know, uh, acquire funds to basically hire a consultant to do analysis of parking. So we stayed away from that one because um, at this point in time, and that would have to be, uh, you know, evaluated at other uh, sometime in the future as directed by the city council. Um, you know, as far as the points on the, the, uh, height increase for, um, projects with the affordable, uh, housing, um, yeah, I mean, we, a step back could be considered. It's something we just felt we would just keep it at the, the 40% footprint, but, um, then you get into, well, what is the appropriate measurement and what are you stepping back from? And um, it takes, anyways, it would take a, quite a bit more of analysis because you want to calibrate it based on the lot size. And you would also want to create the, address, have the circumstances of where you're going to have that setback. So, step um, back. Ian, Ian, if I might, excuse me, I'm sorry for interrupting, but actually in your building massing under 7E, there's a section on vertical articulation for buildings over 35 feet in height and it has um, um some different um components there that we're oh. that. we did actually include that that's right that's right thank you 
I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> Get lost in the mire. Um, so yeah, exactly. So thanks, Kari, for pointing that out. Um, in any case, yeah, that's on page yeah sixteen of the staff report. So um, so we have that. You know, in terms of the cycle network, again. Um, we didn't really get into things that were beyond the, the zoning. I mean, uh, the incorporation of other kind of bicycle network facilities. Um, but I think the the comment, um, you know, as far as the align, uh, I get that 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 kind of implies a rectilinear fashion to road making and pedestrian connectivity. And the word connection actually would would work just as well, if not better. So. Um, staff would be open to uh, making that kind of an adjustment going forward. I think that covers all the points made. Perfect, thank you, sir. All right, do any of my uh, fellow commissioners have any additional questions? I see head shaking no, so I think we can go ahead and uh, close the public hearing and I will open up the floor for a motion and or discussion. Ah, yes, Vice Chair Newman, you have the floor. Not ready to make a motion yet. Um, I want to start by expressing my appreciation to uh, Mr. Holt and to staff um, and to say I appreciate and to a large extent agree with their efforts to clarify code. Um, I think this is a good step um, to where there are gray areas, where there is ambiguity to eliminate it. But I still can't support this, um, and that's on two counts. I want to say some things in favor of subjectivity for a moment. It has served this community well for a long time. And just because the state or someone else is pressuring us not to use it, that's not a good reason for us to take that bat out of our own hands. We would be doing this to ourselves. We can't blame Sacramento or Washington or someone else for this. This, is, this would be a self-imposed uh, restriction of the tools we have to assess each project. And again, I'm in favor of objective standards where they make sense. I just think that that's not the entire universe of tools we have at our disposal. So I can, I can give you examples where subjectivity has, and only subjectivity has saved viewscapes, has saved neighborhoods, has improved things, has made life better for residents. I just don't think we should be throwing that out. I, I, again, though, I do endorse the effort where we're talking about objectivity or ambiguity that we should we should increase those efforts but not at the exclusion of subjectivity which can in the right situation be a useful tool the other the other concern i have here is with the increase in height limit and i understand and i agree with the reasons mr holt gave for setting setting the a, a ceiling rather than a floor. But the problem with that approach that I have is that it starts at a higher point for everyone. And what we're essentially doing is increasing mass in relatively low density residential neighborhoods. And that's not something I think is necessarily a good thing. So I would, I would favor a reworking of that rule to say, to limit the amount of expansion there can be, but start with a lower floor. Don't, don't <clears throat> increase the, the height limit for everyone right out of the gate. I don't think that's a good approach. So I, with those two concerns, I, I'm sorry to say I don't think I can support the proposal as written. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair Newman. Uh, Commissioner Lanson, you have your hand up, sir. Thank you, Chair Newman. I say it again. Thank you, Chair Buss. My God, it's been late. late Who night. am I? <laughs> I know exactly. Um, 
I, I, I agree, Mr. Newman. I, I, I think subjectivity and, and negotiation is an important part of the process. Look what we just did in the last hearing. And that was uh, a, a years, in, in, according to Mr. Sellers, 30 years of negotiation back and forth to try to get something accomplished, which had a lot of subjective nature to it. And I think that is an important part. Uh, my difficulty in looking at this is our general plan is 50 years old and contains lots of elements that uh, are very, very old. And that's one of the reasons we had to end up doing this is because of SB 330, uh, because we didn't have objective standards, which led to a lot of difficulty in terms of trying to interpret and do various projects and creating lots of different, um, I guess, you know, claims and issues uh, with regard to exactly what, what we're enforcing and how we're proceeding. And that's the reason why the state has mandated these kinds of things and the repercussions for us not to implement something in terms of the objective standards, I think is too great for us to try to play with. And again, I appreciate the need to, to fight that issue. I don't think as a planning commission, we're authorized to, to initiate that process. Uh, if the city council wants to do that, they can. Uh, in my review of the objective standard process, again, I had some questions with regard to three modifications, but Mr. Holt answered that question. Um, I think the, the standards are, and again, not to quote Dr. Connolly, but yes, the mandates do provide some basis uh, for, for uh, transparency. And I think that was really the goal in this process. Uh, there are some issues, and again, I wish we weren't being pushed in this, in this regard. There's lots of areas that I want to reserve to the city to have that uh, ability to negotiate without a one-size-fits-all concept uh, that I wish wasn't being done, but, but it is. And it's one of those things where if we don't implement some process, and again, I think, unfortunately, we got stuck doing the general plan update because I think Mr. Newman, you pointed out, we got this a long time ago, um, uh, but I think we got stuck doing a lot of different things. So I think we do need to implement this process. Um, I have no problem with the way that the, the process is written. The height limit is uh, an issue that you pointed out. Um, I do have a concern about that. Again, keep in mind, we're, our, our rules are very, very old. And I think at some point those need to be updated to be consistent with the other zoning and the other rules that we're doing. Uh, to me, that new rule that they've suggested in the way that they've done the height is, in, is consistent with those rules. So I'll go ahead and make the actual motion to approve the staff, uh, to approve the recommendation um, with regard to uh, that it's exempt from CEQA and approve the amendments to Chapter 4 of Title 9 of the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code as described in Attachment 2 to essentially recommend that to the City Council. Thank you. Commissioner Lanson. I know your name. Uh, Commissioner McMahon. Yes, um, the way I'm looking at this is we have we would have these objective measures and if there was some negotiation involved or something that needed to be handled subjectively, the uh, applicant could come to the Planning Commission. Uh, is that correct? Well, if the... Not exactly. If the applicant wished to deviate or not uh, like ask for a modification to one of the, the standards, then that kind of throws them out of that objective. It, it throws them into that discretionary review where there is, but then the findings themselves are not necessarily as subjective as probably past practices. So the thing is, is that once, if a project doesn't comply 100% with the objective standards and then they're going forward with a modification, you could still ask an applicant to comply with the various guidelines that we have that are subjective. And maybe that is a compensating factor in the findings you make for the modification to the objective standards. If However, I at the end of the day, your decision-making cannot be based on a subjective criterion, a guideline. Sure, but just to be clear, I think you did close the public hearing, correct? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. sorry. That's yeah, that's right. Um, I apologize. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm just. I'm sorry. I probably I'm just made feeling, your head spin. Yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. feeling that we do need the objective standards. I, I feel that it protects us in a way from whatever the state may throw at us. And so I'm going to support the motion. Okay, uh, that leaves it to me. And uh, I am uh, slightly vexed about all this. Um, the thing that I thought I understood the least turns out to be an exception that is something that the state of Sacramento has said is okay. 
So it sounds to me like our objective standards may be, in some cases, maybe others that I didn't even recognize when I was first reading it, um, be in conflict with state law. And so I am curious how much of it may be that I didn't even perceive. Um, I, I'm referring to the, the flag lot subdivision um, portion of it in uh, residential neighborhoods. So um, I, I, I find myself uh, looking to my fellow commissioners to tell me what you think as far as that goes. Um, are there things that you saw in this that uh, may or may not jive with, with what's coming down from Sacramento? To quote Dr. Connolly, uh, Sacramento is telling us a lot of things that we need to do, but if we are building a set of rules that uh, don't necessarily agree with what the state's coming down with, do those rules make sense to approve or recommend? Uh, Chair, I would just basically say, if you have questions for staff, maybe the issue is to reopen the public hearing to ask those questions. Yeah. Okay. Let's 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 go back because I I I I I, I think we're going to be split two two here unless I get the clarification. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, reopen the hearing and talk to Mr. A here about this. Sure. Uh, and certainly, Mr. Holt can chime in too. I did. I, I had to cut him off at some point because we were going a little bit too long with the closed uh, with the public hearing closed. So I apologize for that. Um, so I, I think it is important, as Mr. Manson mentioned, um, as you, I think you all recognize, there is this, there are new state regulations requiring objective standards. So it is important that the city have objective standards. And again, as we said at the very beginning, sometimes these objective standards are actually a good thing for everybody. It's, it's a good thing for the uh, developers and the applicants who need to understand exactly what some of the rules are gonna be and what the standards are, and that we lose some of that subjectivity because they need clarity. Mm -hmm. The important thing is the state does require that we have objective standards and they define objective standards now. All right, and but that's not answering my question. Let me get back to what my question was, sure. which is if our objective standards as written are things that staff determined just kind of ad hoc are the best ways to clarify things that are 50 years old, but are no longer in uh, step with what Sacramento is currently passing as far as laws go, well, do we want those standards implemented? So, so the, well, Mr. Oakham's chime in on this too, but the, the objective standards actually are, are actually our standards saying, this is what we want as far as articulation. This is what we want as far as height. This is what we want as far as um, what you get for this type of building and this type of, uh, of, uh, of complex. This is what you have to do. But that's I believe Vice Chair Newman just said that's not something that he wanted as far as the height standard went. So who's, who's we in this? In this? Is this staff? Is this public outreach? Is that what is this, or is this is this is this uh, requirements from Sacramento? So for the specific height one, it's to come up with a definition of height, right? And so when we look at the way it was subjectively, we picked 35 feet as that that typically would be what would happen if it goes 25 feet plus a setback, you start going up, and then the problem we had with it is that it could go up into who knows how high it would go. Yeah. That's why we picked the number. Yeah. If I if I may, can I? Um, I mean, in the height, the height is something that's very much you know, whatever we want to do as a community, right? You know, yes. as far as what measurement that is, that is nothing that's being dictated by state law. And I think what's going to happen, I mean, we're going to be seeing state laws that override zoning more often than not. And SB nine is the example of that. Just the fact that SB9 mentions objective standards does not mean that 100% of all our objective standards have to comply with SB9. Because again, we wanna write objective standards for <clears throat> any residential development of two or more units. And I don't know, I mean, and it was as we had the community development report to city council you know, there's been some papers done by UC Berkeley and what is the likelihood that we're really going to experience SB9 being implemented by the typical homeowner? And it's in the very, very low percentile. But Mr. So, Holt, I would, I, would, I would wager that um, a significant portion of uh, single family homes are being purchased by uh, very large corporate investors and uh, they will be held to the same standards as an individual owner. I suspect that uh, there there could be a significant 
significantly uh, larger market for this for this kind of activity than than you're envisioning, because you're picturing purchasers as single family owners, as opposed to um, uh, large hedge, fund, hedge funds or REITs that can command literally hundreds of millions of dollars and buy significant numbers of properties and and change entire neighborhoods. And that's so, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about these standards. So, Mr. Hood, I do not do not know if you have SB nine in front of you, but SB nine does have. Restrictions on that, for example, they actually yes, it has the owner occupied criteria, and, and right. I don't have it all memorized. But there are limitations on, um, you know, purchasing properties and for the purposes of subdividing and so forth. So, I, I think much of the constraints are really going to be, um, you know, and and again, we haven't really fully evaluated what the ramifications of SB nine are. Uh, in relation to our existing code. Um, I mean, if, you know, the flag lots um, are of particular issue, that's something that can be discussed. But, you know, again, these are objective standards that aren't just written to address, you know, state law. Because, you know, a lot of state laws preemptive, they, they preclude you know, the policy making that local jurisdictions do. They preclude, I mean, SB9 basically precludes the land use designations that we so endorse, we endorsed, or the city council endorsed back in May. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things that the state law is gonna impose on cities. And I think for us to take the time and adjust the code to appease, you know, to address those each step of the way, I don't know. Well, we have to evaluate it further. I mean, we had to do it for uh, accessory dwelling units, and you know, now the city has adopted that. But you know, again, we have to evaluate SB nine further. Copy that. All right, I, I will cede the floor to um, uh, Commissioner McMahon. Uh, yes. So I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I think uh, Chair Bus made a good point about the flag lots and how SB9 uh, would be able to be used by a regular homeowner who wants to divide their lot. And I'm, I'm, my thinking is the whole um, thing that, things that come to us, like if a, if a property owner wants to build on a slope of more than, what is it, 25%, it has to come to us. But we have that objective thing that you, you can't build on a slope. And if you want to, you come to us. So perhaps that type of thing would happen with uh, a homeowner who wanted to build and have and had to have a flag lot because due to this law from the state, you have to be able to utilize your property. So we can still have the objectives, but yet the homeowner would have an avenue around them if he absolutely had to. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's all. <laughs> That's all. all right. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Uh, Vice Chair Newman. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, picking up on what Commissioner McMahon just said, one of the reasons I think this exercise is kind of silly is that ultimately there's always going to be some subjectivity here. Um, her example was the 25% or greater grading, but the test we use in, the, in that case is whether a land use is, quote, reasonable and conforming. And that the reasonableness is itself intrinsically a subjective judgment. So I'm with Mr. Holt all the way, and I appreciate the logic he's applied to this and the rigor he's applied in trying to root out ambiguity where we can. I just don't think that that's an achievable goal or should be an achievable goal on 100%, 100% of the time. Um, I also want to just clarify something quickly about my objection to the the 35 foot uh, increase, the increase to 35 foot maximum. Uh -huh. um, objection one is that it's a 
it's a height increase um, in, a, in a specific two kinds of zones where the, it's really kind of not appropriate here. The rest of this discussion is around general objective design standards um, and it has the feel that we're kind of slipping that, that in where we're not really changing the rules elsewhere, um, just codifying them better. Um, and two is that again, um, I think this is just a difference of opinion about whether we should start with 25 foot as the general rule for everyone or 35 feet as the general rule for everyone. Again, though, I agree that there is ambiguity with the current code as written and we can find ways to tighten it up. I'm just suggesting that we begin with the default of 25 feet rather than 35 feet. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Mr. A here, you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, Chair Bus, just to, uh, as you were talking about your one of your concerns, uh, I pulled up SB9, and uh, the way it reads right now is that um, a local agency for SB9 shall require an applicant for an to be owner occupied. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that. I am. I am also aware at the light speed at which things are passing in Sacramento. <laughs> so you are correct. So it goes up to, for a minimum of three years, and then that's what it, that's how it reads. So it is a minimum of three years, and then also it can't be um, um, that that it. Uh, excuse me. Just that it can't be the rental can can it has to be at least thirty days or more. So there's no um, short term rental fund. Yeah, I, I, I believe Mr. Lanson and I could probably put together a deal that would uh, <laughs> that would satisfy those requirements quite easily. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, moving on, uh, do any of my fellow commissioners have any other further statements on this? All right, then I'm going to go back to closing the uh, public meeting on this. Um, we will go ahead and run with that. Um, Commissioner Lanson has already made the. Uh, <clears throat> made the uh, motion and uh, I guess we'll go ahead and go to a vote at this point. So, uh, Secretary, if you'll prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Nay. Chair Buss? Nay. Motion fails 2-2. Two -two. Oh. Commissioner... Newman and Chair Bus dissenting. All right, where are we at here? All right, there's no appeal period on the recommendation by the Planning Commission to the Council, so. Excuse me, Chair Bus. Yes. Uh, because we have a tie vote on something that's going to be a recommendation to City Council, um, under our code, um, because it was going to be a recommendation to City Council, um, You've kind of already done this, but you normally would go out to open the hearing again and try to see if you can discuss it among yourselves and come up with a uh, ability to break the tie or um, you have to reset it again for another hearing to, if the fifth person could come in and break the tie. Uh, then uh, let's go ahead and reset it for when the fifth person comes in. Okay, so then what the recommendation is then is to reopen the hearing just so you can reset uh, or state that it's going to be uh, reset to the next available hearing date. You got it. All right, uh, I will reopen the hearing. And uh, I would uh, request of staff that uh, we reset this to a date when all five commissioners are present so that we make sure that we're not deadlocked. And I promise to staff that I will read this more thoroughly. <laughs> And, uh, and make sure that I have all of my concerns addressed uh, at the next public hearing about this. Is that sufficient, Mr. Ayer? Yeah, I'm just, I apologize. I'm just reading this carefully. I'm trying to make sure that you would actually have to do this now that I'm reading it for the 18th time. Just, I apologize. Give me a second here because it. Not at all. I don't want to. Okay with the tie vote, actually. <laughs> but yeah, my question was, I didn't. Uh, I mean, you can still present it to the city council, despite our recommendation. The, the, way, right? the way this section reads, nine dash three point seven zero two. Um, it's it's on a motion to approve, conditionally approve, or deny an appeal, a permit, 
for an entitlement or on the recommendation to the city council for their approval of a denial on a permit or entitlement. So I would say that based on that, I think the answer is, I apologize, is actually that it's a uh, denial of the motion. So that is it. You don't need to reopen the hearing. Okay. So and my understanding is, is that still can go forward to city council. It's just without our approval. Yeah. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Oh, okay. Then we're good. All right. Then, then I did accomplish what I wanted to do with my no vote. <laughs> All right. Um, I believe we have no department reports this evening. Uh, so now is the time for uh, commission comments or any AB1234 reports. Are there any comments from my fellow commissioners? Uh, Commissioner McMahon. Yes, uh, I wanted to thank staff so much for getting us this packet early. It made a huge difference. There was a lot to digest, a lot to read, a lot of unfamiliar terms. The vocabulary of architectural design is just way beyond me. So. I, I really, really appreciate getting this packet early. And I know it, it made a little more pressure on you guys, but it made a big difference for me. And I'm, I'm assuming the rest of the commissioners. And if it can happen next time, I'd really appreciate it also. So thank you so, so much. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. I believe you're uh, echoing everybody's sentiments about this, uh, this meeting. Uh, Vice Chair Newman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and you're you're right about that. Um, at least as far as uh, at least for me, um, the extra day was a huge help, especially with this much reading. Um, on the point about advancing the um, our our no vote tonight onto the city council, um, I hope this isn't the end of the discussion. Just want to reiterate again, I'm in favor of objective criteria where they make sense. Um, and I'm glad to continue the discussion around uh, tightening up laws where, where we can. I just want to be sure that we retain the all of the tools that we have at our disposal um, to make better decisions as we did tonight about, about any applications before us. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chair DeBess. Just a quick question. When are we going to get access to the new uh, system to allow us to actually take notes on our computers as opposed to printing everything out? Sorry. I don't know if staff knows that answer. I don't think anybody on staff is uh, is certain. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Um, I, I think staff is excited yeah. to find out when that will happen as we are. All right, thank you. I'll make a note of that, Mr. Lanson, to ask about it. All right, and uh, now we'll move on to staff update. Uh, Planning Division Manager Kari Finley, are there any follow-up items, announcements, or upcoming issues? Yes, yeah, just um, real quick. Um, one item that may be of particular interest on the City Council agenda tomorrow evening is um, that the Council is going to receive an update on the Climate and Environmental Action Plan that's being prepared by the Public Works Department. And the reason I want to bring it, this to your attention is that it's closely tied to the general plan update as the general plan policies and then the strategies presented in the Climate and Environmental Action Plan will ultimately be integrated and cross-referenced within the two documents. So it is relevant. It's also relevant to a lot of the comments we keep hearing um, from, from the public. So that's all I had on that. Would you like me to go forward with the- Thank you. And if you can report on our meetings. upcoming meetings, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So the next plan commission meeting is scheduled in two weeks on November 8th. And there's one agenda item concerning development on the lakes property. So that should be an interesting one as well. And that's all I have today. Thank you so and much. Will that be in person? Um, yes, unless that's changed. Mr. Heher, have you heard anything different, <laughs> or Mr. Parker? Uh, I, I can answer right now. I, I know that the recently this um, Ventura County extended the time period, so I don't know how that affects us as far as continuing. So probably plan for, for Zoom, but uh, another one I will ask about Mr. Ranson just to ensure some clarity yeah. on both those issues that you just raised. We'll have to get back to you, yeah. 
I'm sorry, was the question in relation to uh, uh, meeting in person? Yes, sir. It's next meeting in person. Uh, council is addressing it on a month by month basis. There's a currently, they, they uh, took action that is scheduled to expire, in which case we'll be back in chambers in November unless council extends their action. Copy that. All right, well, thank you very much uh, to staff, uh, everyone that attended this meeting, anybody that is still watching us th this late hour. Uh, thank you so much to uh, everyone, uh, my fellow commissioners, staff. Uh, you guys all have a wonderful evening. The meeting is now adjourned to the next meeting on November 8th, 2021 at 6 p.m.